Well, good afternoon, uh, Bob and Max. It's great to see you guys. Hey, Michael, thanks for having us. Yeah, nice to be here. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, welcome to everybody who's uh, joining this evening for uh, three degrees of hydronic design. Uh, the premise of the catchy title is it's three different perspectives on hydronic design. Uh, so that would be obviously Bob and myself and Max. And we're actually going to look at three different systems and we're going to get three generations of opinions on those systems. A little bit of uh, background on us as a company. Uh, so Eden Energy Equipment, we are uh, hosting this uh, event along with uh, Max and Bob joining as co-hosts. Eat Energy was uh, founded in 1981. We're a specialty distributor based in Ontario. Uh, we have two engineers on staff. We have a technical team on staff. So we do all of our own in-house designs, technical support, etc. cetera. Uh, I can't remember when I met Bob, but that would have been uh, many years ago. And Max, I think I even met you many years ago. So Bob, give us a quick intro of yourself and then we'll get you to go, Max. Yeah, so currently I'm a, a trainer with Calapi. I've been with them about 12, 13 years now, I guess. Before that, I was a plumber. Uh, with my own company. I had two companies. I actually had one in Park City, Utah that we started in 1978. And then we sold that in 94, moved to Missouri, had a just kind of a one-man show there doing mainly uh, radiant floor heat. I just kind of specialized there and then got an offer from Cluffy to come on board and uh, said yes. And it's been uh, great ever since. So I've been, I come up to Canada quite a bit, actually. Used to come up there quite a bit in the last year. Obviously, I haven't traveled too much. COVID has hampered that a little bit. <laughs> probably met a lot of the people on the on the line here today. So welcome everybody. Yeah, and I'm uh, Max Rohr, so I'm back with Kalefi for almost a year. I worked for them uh, right out of college about 10 years ago, uh, and then since then I've worked at the wholesale and manufacturing and manufacturing uh, rep levels, uh, but have always really liked working with Eden Energy. They've got a fun catalog of products and do uh, really uh, innovative systems. So we're excited to kind of uh, go from the past to the, the future today with the presentation. Sure. Yeah, I think uh, it's safe to say all three of us are excited to have this discussion. Bob and I, we met years ago uh, at our training facility. I don't know if you remember, Bob. Uh, Kalefi said, hey, we'd like to bring Bob up. Do you think you want to do a technical presentation? And I said, sure. Uh, nobody told Bob. So Bob showed up to about 50 contractors, gave me this look like, can we talk for a second? And I said, wing it, man. <laughs> do you remember that, Bob? Yeah, and we pulled it off. I've been up there a few times, I think. I, yeah. I know the location more than once. So that was that was the most memorable. That's where you and I met for the first time in person. Uh, Max and I met when he still worked at Rayhow. And uh, so it was great to continue to work with you at Calafi. Um So my background, I've been with Eden now for 20 years. Uh, I'm the responsible for the tech support and the technical training. Uh, previous to that, uh, I worked on the tools with my father. So something similar to what Max has done. And uh, it's been a great experience. I've got some great mentors, and you know, hopefully today uh, Bob and Max are going to be able to share some insights as we uh, move through this presentation. Um, the first most important thing is we're going to give some stuff away today, so we've got to let you guys know how. Um, as we go through this presentation, you can type your questions in. Uh, we have a significant number of people here, so everybody will remain on mute. Uh, but give us your questions, give us your comments. Uh, the best questions and comments, we've got a bunch of swag bags of some really nice IBC toots for the winter time, some summer caps from IBC, Flappy, and some, some nice drinking mugs that uh, we'll give away. Uh, at the end of the presentation, Max and Bob and I are just gonna pick what we think are the most interesting or creative comments, and we're just gonna throw some free stuff away to people. Uh, we've got some Visa gift cards we're gonna give away too, but we're gonna talk about that as we get to the uh, end of the presentation. So Max, I'm gonna throw this to you. Uh, if you wanna just have a quick discussion uh, from the standpoint of the old school boiler system illustrated with this gravity setup we have. Sure, so let's, uh, we'll step into the, the time machine and go back 90 years or so. And uh, we'll take a look at the heating system on the, the screen here. So uh, you see some radiators, which you know, that's, a, that's a concept that's still around with us today, might be a little bit different, uh, lower temperature design, these might be you know, big monster cast iron radiators. Uh, something that you don't see here uh, is a circulator. There's no pump here. There's also kind of a weird looking expansion tank up at the top of the system here. Uh, so what we're relying on with this type of system is uh, buoyancy. So we're not moving water around with the circulator. We're not forcing it through. We're relying on that, that hot water to rise and that cold water to sink back to the boiler. 
So do you want to tell us a little bit more about how you would design a, a gravity style system? Yeah, and in fact, I had to bone up on this a little bit because obviously I've never designed one. But uh, if you want a lot of deep information on this over at heatinghelp.com, Dan Holohan's got some pretty good stories about it. But you're usually limited to about three stories because you'd run out of uh, fizz, you'd run out of heat if you went much further than that. The pipes had to be large, and that's kind of a sizing uh, chart over there on the left, so that you could have that gravity circulation. And it was a little sensitive. In fact, even if you didn't ream your pipes on all these connections here, because this was typically all threaded pipe, that could upset the balance of these. And the other thing that was unique about this system is you had to go on the upper floors and you had to valve those radiators down to make the lower ones work because the hot water wants to rise up and go to the highest point in the system and the lower floors wouldn't get any heat. So you'd have to go up there and somebody in the top floor would have to crank down that angle valve on those radiators up there to make sure that the lower ones got enough heat. Uh, some of the old timers figured out a way around that and they would put little orifices in the upper ones. In fact, one of the guys at one of the Holohan stores, the guy would take his chewing tobacco, the lid off his chewing tobacco, and he would put that in that inch and a half, or whatever the connection is on the radiator and just put like a quarter inch hole in it and he'd make his own orifices and that would force the water to go down to the bottom. So if somebody inadvertently opened the valve wide open on the top floor and the bottom level didn't get any heat, um, that was a way around to put an orifice in there. You're also limited on how far you could go um, offset horizontally to make these systems work. And that's what all the, the old timers figured that out and had these charts. They're not very forgiving if you want to go in there and start modifying these, like add radiators or move them and do stuff like that. They, they were pretty, you know, the guys that put these together understood what the limitations of these were and typically worked with it within those limitations. So if you come across one of these, um, yeah, ask somebody that knows a little bit about how they were designed and what you can and can't do with this type of system. So, yeah, I was out on one today, Bob. Uh, so we still run into systems like this. Uh, it was a gravity system that had been re retrofitted with a booster pump, which Max is going to talk about next. And yeah. it's exactly that. The building owner was pushing the contractor to start cutting piping out, not recognizing there's an awful lot of stuff in the walls, including the monoflow tees, which we'll talk about, that we have to be careful we don't interfere with. One of the things Bob was hoping you could talk about is this right here. So a lot of the times people see that like mount on the wall in the living room and go, hey, what kind of an expansion tank is that? Can you explain that cushion tank and what purpose it serves in the system? Yeah, and that was, we called them a compression tank or they called them a compression tank back in the day and we still do. There's no bladder or anything in there. And what there's one of two ways that you would see these systems, I'm sure there's other ways, but the main two ways that they would pipe these that they would put that compression tank up on the high level like that for your expansion another way they would do it if the, if the bottom if the radius were connected across the bottom in the bottom and out the other side on the bottom what some of the guys would do is they would actually leave that airspace in there and that would become your compression tank so you would go to this job and say well i can't find an expanded compression tank anywhere in this building how does the system not pop the relief valve every time it heats up and that was the key that you had to leave some air in those radiators and that was the expansion space so in fact holohan explains when he was early uh, learning systems he went around and he bled all the radiators and by the time they got down to the basement the relief valve and the boiler was popping off because they took the <laughs> they took the compression tank out of the system of it, yeah. so that's another thing when you start tinkering with these you got to understand that that tank um you know if the radiators have bleeders and they're full of water all the way up you need to have that tank in there if you can leave some air in each one of those radiators and that got complicated when you start to put a booster when you convert these systems which we'll i think we got a next slide we'll talk about some of the problems you could have with or without that tank when you start putting in a, uh, a pump and trying to make this a forest circulation system. And that's something yeah. that a thermal camera could be your best friend with something like this too. So if you walked into an old system like that, you don't see that compression tank up at the top and you look at your, you know, with your thermal camera and you see that there's only, you know, one third of that is the is water and the rest of it's air, that could be a good indicator that, hey, I might need to leave that up there. That might be my expansion tank essentially. So that yeah, could be- 100%. Yeah, the, the big thing with these systems, and we like to just point it out, because again, we're going to talk about three different systems. We're going to talk about gravity, and then we're going to go to condensing and a heat pump. This is actually a really safe system, right? It's a very low pressure system. Uh, the cushion tank, as I'm calling it, typically has an overflow on it. It's it's not going to be, and or as Bob's identified, it may not even be in the system. The top of those rads are acting as that cushion for it. So really, the big takeaway from this slide is just to understand there's a lot of stuff in this that you might be scratching your head at. Uh, I'm fortunate I've had some smart mentors over the years who've sat me down and shown me these jobs and, and done what Bob just did and, and given a good explanation of be careful. This is not a get the saws all out and just start cutting into the system. You've got to think and, 
and find your way through it. So moving on from that one, uh, we're going to want to talk about our next one, and I'll just advance our slides here. Uh, so this is almost the same. Uh, Max, walks us through what we've got here. All right, so we've added a new component here on the left. So this was what, in, in 58, I think, is when Correct, yeah. Nico came out with the, the uh, and it wasn't called a circulator, right? This was still called a pump, and it might give you the ability to go uh, a little bit more lateral potentially that you're not you're not limited by just the buoyancy of the water kind of going straight up a three story building you might uh, open yourself up to some some weirder you know, wider systems with this type of pump uh, and you can see it in the the diagram here so just a single booster uh, B and G booster on the the right is what they they call out in that bottom right corner there let's see if I can yeah we got two worlds colliding here we were showing you a takeo pump which is developed you know, back in 58, but uh, when uh, Bell and Gossip first came out with it, they actually called it a booster. As you can see on the bottom yeah, there, it's right. called a VNG booster. And that's, the intention was that they could make these gravity systems, uh, convert them to a force circulation system, get a little more distance on their horizontal runs, get a little bit more, um, you know, even temperature throughout the system where they weren't dependent on just the buoyancy to drive it. So, And one of the things that you mentioned that was really important on the first slide, Michael, and is the uh, balancing is different. So in that gravity system, that top radiator was going to get warmest quickest. Uh, when we introduce a circulator or a, a booster pump or whatever, it's actually now kind of the, the opposite, that it's looking for the path of least resistance. So it's going to circulate through the easiest, you know, path around the circle here, uh, which may not be that most remote uh, radiator, and that's where these monoflow fittings come in. So we actually have to force some flow down into all those radiators, uh, or else it's just going to do a hot loop through the mains all the way back to the boiler, and we haven't really heated up much of the radiators at all. Yeah. So two things have changed on this drawing. Number one, there's a circulator booster pump. They're all kind of the same thing at the end of the day. And there's also monoflow T's in the system to force the, uh, the flow to the radiators that you want to go. Now be aware when you have a monoflow system, now you've got a series system. These radiators, if you look at the way the flow is going around this, these are in series. So while you're not limited by the height of the building because you can move the water through with the, with the circulator, uh, you are limited in the temperature because you're going to start losing temperature in series. Just like when you put a bunch of fin tube baseboard on a long loop of 60, 70, 80 feet of fin tube baseboard, by the time you get to the end of the road, you got 120 degree water. The same thing happens with a, a monoflow system because you're going through radiator to the next one, to the next one, the next one. And the same thing, you can't do a lot of modifications. Now, some guys successfully will put TRVs on these radiators. They don't change the piping, but they'll put a, a thermostatic radiator valve so you've got some adjustability for maybe a remote bedroom or if this is a two level building or something like that you could have some adjustability usually you can get away with that but you can't go in and start changing the piping adding length to it cutting the radiator out and just capping them off there's certain things you gotta adhere to in fact we're going to talk about Sigenthaler's book there's yeah. actually there's actually 16 different steps involved in properly designing the monoflow system if any of you guys get John Sigenthaler's yeah. book <laughs> So if you, if you don't own this book, then I've got two copies, one for home and uh, and one for work. Uh, wow. It is definitely must read material. Um, we're gonna illustrate in a second here, we're gonna live draw this system, but to Bob's point, you can't go to a higher authority than Siggy and uh, he's got 12 or 14 pages dedicated to these monoflow tees and how to deal with them. The big takeaway is again, sort of my conversation, the job I saw today, the timing was perfect. Uh, the contractor had the wherewithal to go, whoa, we're not just going to start ripping this apart. We're going to call Eden. They're going to send somebody out. We're going to look at this together. And, you know, we want to make sure at the end of the day it works. And it, it can be tricky enough when everything is, you know, really clear and, and easy to work on. Now, there are ways you can modify this, and that's kind of what Sigenthaler's spin on the, on the monoflow system, because I don't know, a lot of people put diverter T's in. I don't know that you can get them from everybody anymore, but there's ways that you could add it, like in this drawing here, if you wanted to add an addition on this house and put a loop, there are ways you can pipe in uh, with some T's. You could pipe in like a panel radiator or a different type of heat if you know how to properly tie it into this loop and get it balanced. And that's kind of what the, uh, like you said, in Sigenthaler's book, there's about 10 pages on how you can add a, what we call a subsystem to a, an existing monoflow system. Yeah, and make we're going to share some thoughts on, on one method, but to Bob's point, it's a great book. If you haven't read it and you're in hydronics, you're, you're in for a treat. It's, it's really worth reading. So we're going to talk a little bit of where we're going to take that gravity system, and we're going to do a little bit of drawing, and the three of us are going to comment on it. 
So what we're going to do is we're going to take that gravity system and we're going to convert it. Uh, in this case, we're going to convert it to a good Canadian made product. Uh, Bob and Max, I, I know you're in the States, but you can rah rah Canada today with me. Uh, so the SL1085 is a great boiler. One of the things we have to be conscious of as we pipe it in is that there's nothing wrong with the head loss on the boiler, but be aware of it. We're about to go from a gravity system with very low head loss. We're going to put in a fantastic boiler that's got some head loss in it. And we're going to talk about some of the things that come with that as we draw it. Um, for this scenario, we're going to replace a rental water heater, which is pretty commonplace with an indirect. And again, we're going to talk about our method of piping that in to sort of uh, limit some of the issues we'll encounter. We're going to add all the common trim items. And to Bob's point, we're going to draw in a outer area, which happens a lot. So we're going to add in some Reha Rao panel that can go down on the floor or on the wall to do some heating. And uh, as we sketch that out, it'll be a, a good illustration of what you're going to see uh, from flows and heads. One of the most important things that I'm going to hand over to Max to talk about is, again, this, this is an old system. It's got a lot of iron pipe. So we definitely want to be conscious of the ferrous materials that are in that system. Max, walk us through the product we see in the top left on this slide. So let's say you were one of the early adopters in you know 58 with that, that Takeo pump and you built one of these systems and now uh, you have decided you're going to redo the whole mechanical room like Michael's talking about with the ModCon. Uh, you probably have a lot of ferrous debris and magnetite and you know, boiler ink floating around in that system. Those big cast iron radiators have been oxidized by the water. Water quality wasn't really something that we paid attention to, I mean, until the last 10, 15 years. So there probably, you know, wasn't uh, a whole lot of uh, thought to that. Initially, it's probably just site water that may have a lot of uh, magnetic garbage rolling around the system. So if you put that in, and then the middle picture there is that uh, this is from an ECM pump, I believe. I'll circle it with the pen here. This is going to be, or maybe I will. Yeah, this is going to be the spot. Sorry, I'm struggling with the pen a little bit. Right there. That's going to be where all that magnetic garbage in your system is going to end up. You can see how strong that magnet is holding up the pair of pliers there. So it's just going to, like a sponge, suck all that magnetite and all that cast iron debris right into that spot. And it can you know, shorten the life of that pump. So a magnetic separator like this Kalefi unit right here. And uh, then we also have a Dirt Mag Pro that we launched just a, a couple weeks ago that's brass with uh, two magnets in it. So one from the top and then a band around the side. Uh, that's where you want to catch the magnetic garbage. You want to catch it in that uh, collision filter. And then you want to uh, purge it out the bottom before it gets to your expensive components like your ECM pump or your new uh, you know, ModCon boiler. That's the last place that you want uh, you know, 50 years of magnetite to end up. That's really yeah, so I, I brought one with me. Uh, what I particularly like about this, and it certainly isn't a Kalefi pitch as much as I have two friends from Kalefi here, is I can rotate it. So if I got boiler with piping off the bottom, I rotate and connect it. If I'm, I'm going the other way, I can rotate it. Uh, the magnet is on the bottom. And to Max's point, the scenario we're looking at, the Takeo 0015 E-Pump is perfect for pretty much every residential application I would do with an IVC boiler. If we don't put this in, well, you do have a dirt magnet in. You just don't have an intentional dirt magnet, yeah. right? That 0015 is going to eat that ferrous material up. And then uh, the fine folks at Takeo, whether it's Dave Holdorf or Diverson or Miller, are going to get a phone call of, hey, your pumps are garbage. And the first question they're going to ask you is about the system, not the pump. It's hard to keep oxygen out of these, especially these old systems. Anywhere there's a packing on a valve, actually that's a three-piece pump in the drawing there. You got a mechanical seal there, oxygen get in there around those mon or those uh, flow control valves. There's a packing on those stems, oxygen get in there. If there's hand wheels on all those radiators, so these things are just an O2 sieve, and that's why you find so much uh, corrosion inside these old iron pipe systems, these old cast iron radiator systems. So when you go to upgrade these, it's almost impossible to flush that out 100% and say, okay, I've got it perfect. But even if you replaced a lot of that with copper pipe, you're still going to have a lot of you know, sludge and uh, ferrous materials that can get into these ECM circulators and cause a problem. Now, obviously, all the manufacturers of those circulators are stepping up and trying to figure out a way to keep you know, that product out of there. But if water can get to that wet rotor pump, 
trust me, that boiler ink, like you see coming out of that separator over there on the left, it looks like black water, but it actually the black in there is actually small metal particles. And they'll get through, you know, pretty much anything that um, that water will get through. So why not protect um, that investment, that pump and all the components by putting some kind of magnetic function in it? Yeah, I'm just going to look at a few questions. When I'm looking off camera, I have a spare monitor, so I'm just looking at some of the Q&A that's coming in. Um, one of the good comments that came in from uh, Rainier, I'm, and I apologize if they destroyed your name there, he's pointing out that Takel makes the monoflow tees. Unfortunately, they don't anymore. Uh, I recently tried to order some for a project, and they're in the catalog, but no longer available. Um, Bob or, or Max, are you aware of a vendor that does actually still make them that you've used recently? I believe Bell and Gossett's still out. I think one of the um, um, recent posts on uh, heatinghelp.com, somebody was buying them with the, because they were asking about the, the color of the band. There used to be a blue band and a red band version of it. I think you can just get the red band version of it. I believe they're still available. And then I heard somebody said that you can actually buy the adapter to go into a T and make your own. Of course, it wouldn't be labeled. And somebody down the road might not know what that is. But yeah, the original ones had a marking on them. So number one, you knew the direction and also that you knew it was a T. But if I'm not mistaken, I don't know if anybody from B&G is, is tuned in here, but uh, I'm pretty Could sure be. that well, in so if anybody from B&G, or I know there's some Taco guys, feel free to correct me if I was wrong in my statement, but I, I did reach out on that. A um, couple other comments about the uh, the cushion tank. So Mike is pointing out that uh, they utilize a relief that would go out through the roof. And then we've got uh, another participant here is pointing out in their case, it went out through the outside wall. I, it, it, the cushion tank will have an overflow. Uh, with old school systems, you don't necessarily know where it's going. It could be going on a drain on the floor. It could be going on a laundry sink. Um, but that is the purpose of it. Yeah, the neighbor's yard. Uh, Charles had just asked a question specifically to do with the separator I showed. Uh, so these come made by Calafi in just about every size. Uh, my personal preference uh, is in the smaller sizes, like up to inch and a quarter, I would do a separate dirt and air. Anything over inch and a quarter, it's actually more cost effective to do a SEP4. We'll show that as we draw. That's a hydraulic separator that has built in air and dirt. You're putting one piece in, so you're saving labor, and it's achieving the effects of the three pieces that you would put into the system. And since you brought that up, one thing I do when we have a new product coming out from Cluffy, I'd like to see how they work. So I try and build a clear plastic version of it. So that's our SEP4 there. And you can see it's got an air separation function with the median here. It does dirt separation. I don't have it on right now, but there's a magnetic band on here. So you've got your hydraulic separation. Your closely spaced T's is what you're looking at on both sides. You've got your air removal, you've got your dirt removal, and you've got your magnetic function down at the bottom. So it's fun to flow water and air through these and see how well they, regardless of the brand, obviously, but um, everyone I've ever tested does, you know, 90, high 90% air removal and the same thing with particle removal if they've got the magnetic function on them. Yeah, for sure. Like Calafi makes a really good product. Tago makes a good product. The magnet has a separation in it, so as you rotate it, the debris comes out of the bottom. And to just illustrate what Bob was saying, it, it comes off. So if you want to pull it off and purge it into a pan, you can. The photo you're looking at is for a job I went to just before COVID. Uh, they went through a pile of pumps and I think three boilers before they found us. Um, I went out with some really high tech equipment. It was a $30 TDS meter. Uh, so that's reading 9,750 parts per million. Uh, to put that in perspective, that's about 900 times outside of your warranty. That's also 1% not water. So it actually looked like I was drinking tea or testing tea. Um, you're not gonna get warranty on that. It is very easy for, if it's Taco with the pumps or IBC with the boilers, it takes very little work for them to figure out if it's a water quality issue, just from the standpoint of all the crap that's uh, built up in the system. So you should never get to 9,000 parts per million, but even if it was 500, it's not good. This is just an example of, it can get really, really bad. And a fire tube boiler doesn't fix that, by the way. That drawing on the left was filled with Chicago city water, right out of the city water. And what happens is everything that you see in that cup there that Mike was reading with that meter, when you put heat to the metal, all that stuff goes to the hottest point in that system. So those fire tube boilers, since the heat's still on the metal, all that stuff is coming out of solution. And that's what's in that boiler. That They told me, I, I know a little bit about that boiler there, uh, that that was um, just filled up one time with Chicago, Ch Chicago city water. In fact, it had a fill system, uh, you know, reservoir on it. Didn't even have a, a makeup. Somebody said, well, it had a leak in it and it took on gallons. And no, it didn't. It had like an axiom or some kind of fill tank on it. So that's what can happen when you put that kind of uh, water in the system and you put fire to it and those minerals just come out of uh, 
and all the white spots on those tubes on that boiler, that's where that boiler failed. And that's not a warranty issue. <laughs> that didn't come from the factory looking like that, I'm pretty sure. So. Yeah, so I mean, the big thing to take away from this is what Bob said. There, there isn't a standard, like I'm, I'm drinking a glass of water. There is no standard for dissolved solids in that water. A lot of misconceptions are, I'm drinking this water, it's good for my boiler. So uh, the water in Guelph, where our head office is located, it's you know between 480 and 500 parts per million, I'm drinking. Well, if you look at a fire tube heat exchanger, they don't want anything over 150. So just standard water out of the tap is not acceptable. Uh, Max and I have done previous presentations on how to control water quality, so you can watch one of those. You can shoot me an email, call me. We just want to really beat home, like magnetic dirt separation is no joke. We definitely need to do it. Um, the other thing quickly is just talking about air separation before we get into doing some drawing. Um, Max, you want to just walk us through this slide? Yeah, I think the easiest way to explain it is if you fill up a system and it's cold, uh, you might vent some air, some bulk air out of it right away. There's a lot of uh, a lot of dissolved air uh, hidden lurking in that water that's going to come out as soon as you heat it up. So um, one of the things that sometimes people will do when they're commissioning a system is is get it up to design temperature because you need to in order to get all that air out of the the system and and make up not just city water but from your glycol feeder or something like that. But uh, it's it's something that could lock out your boiler when it gets cold enough outside unless you you know cook it out and, and vent that air through a, a micro bubble scrubber like that uh, really well uh, on commissioning and that's kind of what the the chart shows there yeah and the, yeah, the, the high biggest high mis high sorry about the biggest misconception about. that we see on this is that people fill it with water and don't understand that it's standard pressure you've got about three and a half percent air in that system and it's only going to show up when you heat it. So guys will flush the system saying, well, I flushed the air out of it. Well, that's true. You flushed out the Coke bottle air, but you've got all that dissolved air that's entrained and it comes out when the system gets heated. So air vents aren't going to solve that. You need an air separator with a coalescing media, which Bob just showed with that set four. That comes inside these air separators you saw as well. So Bob, back to you. You had a comment on that. Yeah, I would encourage people to take it up even below, above, you know, if you've got a low temperature radiant system, I'd run that boiler at 180 degrees if I could for a couple hours, because an example of this is just take a pan and put it on your stove tonight and put water in there and stand there and turn on the burner. And from the second you turn that burner on, you'll see those little bubbles. And the more you heat that water, the more those bubbles, the faster those bubbles come out up until boiling, of course. But uh, you got to get that boiler up pretty high temperature to get that entrained air, which is air that's in the water that only comes out of solution when you put heat to it and the pressure. That's what this graph is showing, the relationship between temperature and pressure as far as air removal. So, uh, you know, get that temperature up as high as you can. And uh, especially if you have an indirect tank, you know, if that's gonna run at 180 degrees on a low temperature system, get that boiler up to 180 before you leave it and you'll get a lot more air out. And you, won't, uh, you won't have to, you know, have issues with noise or a callback if you get a big air bubble somewhere that stops circulation. Perfect. So we're getting a ton of great questions. I'm going to keep moving along and then we'll uh, we'll come back to some of the questions as we go through. So what we're going to do here is we're going to have a, uh, a quick discussion uh, about what we've drawn, drawn here. So really what I want to show uh, is this is our, our old traditional boiler. In this case, we've shown a booster pump on the system. Uh, to Bob's point earlier, it's all large diameter piping. So the total head loss through this system is, is very, very insignificant. Uh, and you'll see everything here is in series using monoflow keys. Um, Bob had mentioned this earlier, but one of the things you have to be careful about is all of this is in series. So I, I'm going out to my first rad at 180, which is fine. Uh, but by my last rad, I, I'm not doing 180 degrees. Bob, is there anything you wanted to touch on on this drawing before we start talking about retrofitting it? Well, yeah, a couple of things is, you know, depending on the resistance of that radio that you got connected to it, sometimes you have to put two monoflow T's on there to get enough resistance in that main to push it down to that radiator. And so one of the first steps when you design this from scratch is you pick whatever you want your operating delta T to be, let's say, um, obviously on this one's a little bit higher. Let's say you want to run it at a 20 degree delta T, you're going to supply it at 180. What you want to do is you want to take the average temperature going through that system to size your radiator, not the 180 degrees, because as you can see, not even the second radiator is getting 180 degrees. So if you size that 180 degree supply, 
and you're not getting there. So that's why it's important that you choose your delta T that you want to operate at, and then you use the average temperature, just add it up and divide by two, obviously, and that's where you get the average temperature, and that's where the radiator is sized by the um, average water temperature, not the first um, uh, supply temperature out of the boiler. Yeah, for sure. So uh, moving on from this, we're going to uh, actually just take a look at how we would retrofit that. So we're gonna move down a little bit. So typically you got two choices of doing it. So what we'll sometimes see is people will come in and say, I'm gonna take this boiler out of the equation completely. Uh, and then all I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna take my beautiful IBC SL boiler and I'm gonna pipe it in directly. So the challenge in doing that is that this booster pump was only designed to deliver, in this case, six gallons a minute at like five or six feet ahead. Well, we've just doubled the head loss in that system by tying this boiler directly to it. The other thing that I don't like about that particular strategy is I don't want to have accountability for anything. Uh, you know, it, it comes down to like the whole liability conversation. I want to be responsible for whatever I went there to do, which is this. So there's two different ways to get around it. I'm gonna do it the easy way. I'm gonna do the separator that Bob just showed you. So in the case of the hydraulic separator, I'm gonna connect my supply and I'm going to connect my return. And we're gonna come out, go into our supply and we're gonna come back and go into our return. And what I like about this is that if the contractor gets a phone call, you know, two weeks after the system has started up, there's no comment about what was existing. There's no issues with those mono flow tees. What we've put in is only seen on the left-hand side here of the SEP4. Uh, now, I'm not showing air and dirt, but Max, I think you can probably explain why we're not showing air and dirt. We put a SEP4. Yep, so we've got all that built into one box. And then it really, uh, we've replaced what's generating the heat, but like you're saying, Michael, we're not, we're not, pushing a different flow through the boiler. We're not making one side of the system fight the other because they're two completely different pumps now. They're hydraulically separated. In fact, on the bottom of that picture right there, it says HS for hydraulic separator. That's what it's doing is hydraulically disconnecting the right side of that system from the boiler side of the system. So there's no issue with the boiler. It's gonna get the flow that the manufacturer requires under any condition and that, even if somebody was gonna shut off some radiators or put some TRVs or something in there and the system will have the pump that it was designed to have in there and it'll work. So the two are, it's like they're on two different pages, so to speak, when you look at them hydraulically speaking. And this is a great way to do it because you've got your protection for your separation hydraulically, your air, your dirt, your magnetic, everything's in one box for you. And the liability goes away if you've protected that boiler and the, the piping that was in the home or the building. Yeah, so what I've done is I've just shown the head loss path. So to sort of reiterate what we're all saying, you can see where the head loss path for this pump is. So at the end of the day, the building owner, the homeowner, we're, we're not responsible. We've left their system the way we found it. The only thing that we've done is we've come in and we've added in the separator. If I take the separator out of it, I'm now counting on this pump being able to overcome the head loss in a fire tube. So on a small fire tube, you're, you know, there is a good argument that you could potentially do this entire system with a 0015E3. We could literally just take the SEP4 out completely uh, and just have it direct connected and have one pump do it. Uh, but it makes a big difference. We went from five or six feet ahead to 11.6 feet ahead, but we've also disturbed these monoflow tees that, you know, Bob gave us a great intro on. It takes 12 pages of instruction to do it right. And rather than just hydraulically separating it, we decided to monkey with the system. So my well, attitude on all of it is maybe doesn't really make me sleep at night. One of the best first questions, if you come across a job like this and you're asked to do this, replace that boiler, I would ask them, has the system worked in the past? Is it working now? Yeah, yeah. And if they say, no, it's never heated in the two upper bedrooms, then you've just inherited that problem yeah. by putting that boiler in and they're gonna blame it on you. So you wanna make sure that if it was a monoflow system or if it was a, a gravity system, that it did in fact work before you started uh, changing things because you're gonna be saddled with that job for the rest of your career. Yeah. If, uh, if it doesn't work properly, well, really. has been in there what else have they changed if they yeah. happen to know if it's they moved in the house or the building well, and, the, and the reality is that the piping we've drawn here we can see all the piping the true yeah. world we can see like the job i was at today i can see 10 feet of piping and it scares me so the 100 feet i can't see i don't want any responsibility for it yeah so you know you can get really creative if any of you have dealt with cody on our team we have a really good tech his name's cody he does tech support design work you know and and he comes up with some really really great ideas 
the reality is that at the end of the day, he always takes those great ideas and thinks about the KISS method, right? Is, that, is this reproducible? You know, if, if we gave this to Max and said, Max, this is our new idea, and he went and told two service techs, could they do it on every job and would it work on every job? It's the same conversation of not hydraulically separate. If I can't give you a direction that works on most jobs, I'd rather not give you that direction. So we had a whole pile of questions come in to talk about the difference between my hydraulic separator versus closely spaced T's and what is the difference. So the reality is uh, the SEP4 has a difference from closely spaced T's in that it does air and dirt, but the principle of what they achieve is the same. Do you want to talk about that a little bit, Bob, while I do some drawing here? Yeah, I mean, that's all the, the separators are is an evolution of the primary secondary where somebody said, hey, why don't we put everything in one box? We want to put air elimination in there. We want to have dirt separation. We'd like to have a little bit more maybe on a low water um, capacity boiler. The hydrocep, you know, some of the hydrocep's hold more water <laughs> than the boilers nowadays. So we've added a mini buffer tank. But the thing of it is, if you pipe it properly, it's going to work. There's very few things that you can do to a hydraulic separator unless you cross the piping and that, that they won't work and protect everything in the system. But, you know, just it, it should save you time. It should make you money, save you money on uh, installation hours to put the separator in there and get all those functions. Because somewhere else in that system, if you use closely spaced T's, you still want to protect the pump and the boilers from dirt and magnetic uh, particles separation. So, but yeah, the, at the end of the day, the function is assuming the primary secondary is done properly with the closely spaced T's that you got your T spacing correct, yeah. you got the sizes correct. You know, that center bore has got to move the entire GPM through that. So you got to make sure it's sized properly and that the, the T's are within a certain distance of one another. And I think it's what, four times the diameter <clears throat> of the pipe coming into it. So if you've got correct. that, part with the ball valve that is not closely spaced anymore no you've lost so your with the hydro separator unless you cut that in half and, and welded Change. an extension to it um, you can't really mess up the principle of it and the other thing about the big barrel of the hydro separator is it's a slower spot in the system which makes it easier to separate the air and the dirt yeah. which you can do with an air separator or a dirt separator it's the reason that they're bigger than the diameter of the pipe uh, but you've again got all that kind of in the same same spot. So the math is if you want to make one of these in your garage out of uh, some of that new PP pipe or whatever, three to one is a ratio. Whatever size pipe you're going to use, this is a one inch pipe, then the barrel needs to be three inches. If this is a two inch pipe, you got to have a six inch barrel. If you have that three to one relationship, this is going to become a low velocity zone. The flow from the top to the bottom of this is under one foot per second. Even if you're jamming the maximum GPM that that piping will allow into that, you're going to have very little um, velocity between the top and the bottom and that's where you get such really uh, excellent separation when you have that low velocity zone where those particles can just fall right out of um, out of solution even the separators that don't have a median side they're doing an excellent job because of that low velocity zone of that big barrel uh, in relation to the pipe that comes uh, into that so yeah so it's it's a highway comparison right so if you're you're sitting on the on-ramp trying to get on the highway in a single lane it's, you know, it's not really ideal until you hit the highway. And as soon as you hit the highway, it's nice and open. You know, there's, there's none of that obstruction, nothing holding that air back or the dirt back from getting out of the system. Really, the difference for me is if it's a small system where I can do, you know, a little air separator or a little dirt separator, I would do closely spaced T's. It makes sense cost-wise. Uh, it achieves the same thing on your primary secondary. Um, when you get into larger sizes, a SEP4 is so much faster to put in. It, it just makes a ton of sense. One of the things I'm seeing commented is you will see in some manuals where they will say your closely spaced T's can be up to 12 inches. That's not correct. I see that in a lot of manuals. That's, that's not the case. And then another comment that was made by Patrick that's really important is the hydraulic separator does actually need to be sized. Just because you're running six inch piping into it doesn't mean you need a six inch SEP4. You have to pay attention to what those flow dynamics are. You want it as a hydraulic separator. You don't want an accidental mixing device where you're trying to go out at 180 and it's mixing it down to 140 by, you know, happenstance, as we say. I like your analogy with the, um, with the highway, and I'd take it a step further, and I'd, let's say the Queen E, which is, what, six lanes in both directions now, you get on there from the on-ramp, and you can have cars going at different speeds. The guy over here can be going 80 kilometers. The guy over here can be going 45, and that's what you were just talking about in the separator. I could have 50 gallons a minute going through my boiler if I've got a boiler that requires that, and only five gallons a minute going out to my system if a zone, the zone system is only one or two zones open. So the separator not only allows you know, the flows to get, you know, mingle in there, but allows them to go through there at different rates. So if you need five gallons a minute on one side and 50 on the other, 
you can do that in the separator. The, the closely spaced T's, that gets a little bit trickier to, um, to make sure that you've got that. And, uh, you know, that 12 inch spacing, that's not gonna not work. It just the more you put between the T's, the more resistance. One inch of pipe has flow resistance at certain a gallon per minute. There could be a lot of flow resistance in one inch of the pipe. So the more you put between the T's, the more flow resistance and what'll happen, that'll encourage flow to go out your secondaries when you don't want it to. You could get gravity or ghost flow going out to a heat emitter when you don't want it to because your T's are too far apart and it's inducing some flow. It's doing what a monoflow T does. You put resistance between them and now, now you yeah. gotta get heat going out to your radiator before it's even calling for heat because you've put a, a little bit of a resistance between those T's. For sure. So we just had the question uh, from Charles on the, are they available in ProPress? Yes, they are. Um, we do these in some pretty giant configuration. We always joke, Max and I, that I don't think we sell the small ones. We seem to only buy eight inch and six inch ones that are the size of a pickup truck, but we do actually sell a lot of small ones. They're all available in ProPress uh, until you get into the sizes where it's, it's flanged, obviously. Um, the other question was like air and dirt separation. The dirt is, is always on the return side, which is highlighted here. I like to put it close to the boiler. It, it could be on this side as well. Um, air separation, it's not about the high point. Uh, I know there's a misconception on that. We want that air separator, if it's not in the SEP4, either located here or here. Um, one of the other good spots to put it, I'm gonna move this indirect, is if we put it uh, before the pump, we can then tie the expansion tank into it because we're at a point where there's limited pressure. But typically I, I like to do it uh, on the return side over here with the expansion tank. But so. then he brings up a good point because what we want is you always want your air elimination at the very hottest point in the system, ideally right at the boiler if you could or in the boiler, which is what the old cast iron boilers had air separators built into the sections. So you always want to do your air separation at the hottest point, but you'd like to do your dirt before it gets back to the boiler on the return side. So when you use a combination device, there is a little bit of a trade-off. I, I, my air is probably my most important thing to get out of the system. So I'm going to put that separator work and do the best job of the air if it's a combination. It's still going to get dirt on the return trip back but yeah it is kind of like an suv it's not great on the highway not great off the highway but it can do both to some extent so when you use a combination device there is a little give and take as far as where to locate it in the system but where you got uh, it drawn there is i mean that's within 18 yeah. inches of where it should be on both components so yeah. yeah yeah so the key thing is this circulator that the existing booster pump if it was on this side of it it's going to be a problem um, this is typically where we would put it over the return side. I prefer putting it over on this side. The reality is the 0015 that I've selected, it puts out the exact head on low speed, keyword is low speed on that circulator, that this boiler uses up all that energy. So by the time I'm coming off of that thing, the expansion tank is not a concern to me, but everything that we put on this side of the separator, we're monkeying with those mono flow T's in the existing system. I don't think an air separator is gonna cause us much harm, but I, I try to not touch anything on that side of the system. And again, that's where a, a SEP4 would come in uh, really nicely. So no, moving so on, uh, the other thing I wanna talk about was the indirect. So uh, the indirect's got a bunch of different options on how we can pipe it. So right off the bat, uh, we're, we're not gonna come in and we're not gonna tie it in over here. Uh, there's a whole bunch of different ways we can pipe it. I'm gonna show it this way just for a second while we discuss it. Um, so the, the big reason why I don't want to pipe it on, on this side of the separator is in the summer tap. I, I don't need to have any kind of ghost flow that's making its way through the system because I've chosen to put the indirect on the load side. It also comes back to our discussions earlier, secondary side, pardon me. It also comes back to our earlier discussions of monkeying with the system here. We want to make sure when the indirect comes into play, that all of the energy from this boiler is going into that indirect. So this is typically how we would do it. Bob, do you want to add some thoughts to it while I finish this drawing? Yeah. If you go back to your first drawing, the other issue with your first drawing is that you got to run two pumps to make it work. You got to run the boiler pump and the indirect pump. If you do yep. it, put it in parallel like you've got shown here, now you just have to one, run that one circulator. Make sure that P7 is sized to handle whatever the you know the resistance is of that boiler and that indirect tank you've got a high pressure drop indirect tank obviously you got to make sure you've selected the right circulator that you can get the flow that the boiler needs because typically those boilers are going to run up to high fire and you want to jam as many gpm through that boiler as you can to recover that tank quickly because in this system you're probably shutting off your heat when you turn on that indirect call so you want to get that over as quickly as possible so 
uh, you know, put it there, jam as much GPM through there as you can and get back to your heating load if you want. But the other thing is why heat up all that piping in the summer? That's all heat loss in the basement or something like that. By doing it this way, you've got a very small run of piping that you have to keep warm to have a domestic hot water call instead of heating up the whole SEP and all the piping on the primary and the secondary side. So. Yeah, so to the point, when this system is in indirect mode, so this SL boiler has the ability for us to define a priority load. So what will end up happening is when this indirect fires, this pump turns off and all the energy from this boiler is, is going into that indirect for a short period of time. It doesn't impact the homeowner's comfort at all. And we certainly don't get that phone call of, well, uh, I've got a problem because I don't have uh, any heat going into the hot water there. So but this is a pretty tried and true way of doing it. Yeah, and that boiler probably lets you time it out too. If somebody left the hot water faucet running and left town or something, the boiler would probably time out and say, wait a second, I'm going back to the heat call. Now, there is one downside to this is your air elimination now is, isn't in the play, but we're assuming this system has been, you know, started up and purged and stuff like that. There shouldn't be air, you know, being generated in that short uh, indirect circuit, but, you know, you're not going through your air separator when you take it parallel. And the last thing I'll say is check both those pumps. If you don't have a check valve on both those pumps, you're gonna have hot flows going through there. You wanna check off that pump uh, so you're not pulling backwards on, in either case. Yeah, I know it's a good comment. Errol, and uh, I believe it's Errol from Lars. Hey, how are you, buddy? He's just pointing out the 12 inch is not on one inch pipe. Uh, the 12 inch would be on, on larger piping, which I think we all agree. Unfortunately, when we're reading manuals, especially for the first or second time, we see that 12 inch and it gets applied. So just to understand the four pipe diameters, um, you know, we want to try to stick to that as much as possible. Um, Eric's asking the question about mixing pipe. Uh, you know, what about mixing in this design if we did some of it in PEX and some of it in copper, can that cause problems? Um, steel pipe from a CSA standpoint in hydronic systems, you're not doing that anymore. Uh, you can use PEX, but Bob, you want to talk about the fun of putting PEX into it if you sized it for copper? Well, yeah, I just know that the inside diameter of PEX isn't the same as copper tube. So if you're going to go, let's say the design comes from Eden Energy and says one inch pipe there and you go with one inch PEX, just know you're putting a little bit of pressure drop in that system because you're not going to get the same flow through that PEX. And obviously you want to make sure the PEX can handle the temperature you're going to run. If you're running 180, 190 degrees, I would think most of them can, but just know that, you know, they step up to a high temperature typically to recover that indirect tank. But if you're going to redo a bigger part of this system, if you're going to do more of the system side, PEX might be your best friend yeah. to get back to those radiators and get to other parts of that building instead of trying to you know, solder copper to, to rebuild some of that. If you were going to take the monoplatees out and put in different panel radiators or something like that, that's exactly what PEX is great for. Yeah, you could have iron pipe, copper pipe, PEX pipe, even uh, you saw, uh, I forgot on your first slide, uh, Aquatherm or one of the uh, PP pipes. Uh, yeah, the new PPPR pipe, yeah. That could be used too, so could be a blend yeah. though. My only drawback on PEX on any sort of primary pipe you want a boiler is it looks like crap. <laughs> yeah, it's hard to make it look nice. And the fittings have a pressure drop, even the, you know, the one the expansion PEX fittings aren't as nice, you know, a flow pattern as like a copper elbow or something. But And you can yeah. buy straight lengths, which would be the yeah. best way to uh, do it because uh, if you're trying to make a you know whole mechanical room of coiled pipe look straight, it's going to be a fight uh, where the straight 20 footers <laughs> might be a, a better approach. Especially with large bore packs, you get over one inch packs, it's not so easy yeah, to uncoil. <laughs> uncoiling <laughs> two inch uh, pipe in the mechanical room to make it look straight. Yeah, straightening it out, making it look good. It'll look good when you leave, but once it heats up, it goes back to that spaghetti effect, and you're like, ooh, how do I? Uh, how do I clear that up and make it good? Before well, we yeah. move on, Bob, do you want to talk about air scoops uh, versus air separators? We have one of our uh, guests is saying, what about using an air scoop? You want to walk through why we don't generally use air scoops anymore? Yeah, I mean, in the day, you know, most of the cast iron boilers that air scoops were designed to and, and hooked onto had air elimination built into the boiler. In fact, it was rare to come up to a boiler that you didn't see an air vent right through the sheet metal on the top jacket of the boiler. And that was doing most of your heavy lifting. 90% of your air was coming out of that vent because that was the hottest point in the boiler. It's right above the burner, number one. A lot of the boilers had actually little sections in their boiler that would do air elimination. So the scoop was probably good enough back in those days. But now, number one, we're using higher speed circulators. You know, those were 1750 RPM uh, circulators, we weren't moving a lot of flow through those big pipe wide open radiator systems. But as soon as we start, you know, moving the flow through there faster, you just don't get those little entrained air bubbles out with a, with a scoop. There's no mechanism inside that scoop to catch those little bubbles. So 
they're just going to go around and around. Maybe they're going to be noisy. Maybe they're not. But, you know, for what um, the advantage of a micro bubble resorb, and I'll credit Spirotherm with the invention of that, it was probably one of the biggest game changers in our industry of all time is something that could grab those little bubbles, especially when we start going with PEX tubing, we start going with high head circulators. You got to keep the air out of those systems. So I would, you know, go with a mic. And that's what's in the most of the separators have that function built into them, have a micro bubble media that's in the, you know, other separators, air separators built into it. Something with sharp edges sharp instead edges. of just a, a single ramp that's going to let that milky water just go yeah. Through over and over again the entrain there yeah 100 percent. i'm not ignoring you guys i'm just looking at the gazillion questions trying to address them as we go yeah. uh we did have a, a great comment on what about air and dirt and that, that's a great point you actually can buy air and dirt um they're great they're packaged little units the only yeah. thing you want to be careful about there is that would be the one exception where it's it's not actually going to end up on your supply piping do you want to talk a little bit max about the difference between supply and return on performance of that unit so the perfect location for an air and dirt in the same box is going to be a chiller because it's going to be the hottest water and the dirtiest water right before the chiller. Uh, with the heating system, you are sacrificing one or the other. Maybe for the size of your mechanical room, that's all you're going to be able to do and it's going to be fine. Um, but the best way to do it is to have the air separator like we talked about on the hottest part of the system, the dirt separator right before the most expensive components in the system you're picking kind of one or the other if you do an air and dirt combo unless it's a chiller and then you're in great shape and it's just in the same spot back in the chiller the yeah, water's so back to the chiller warmer hot. than yeah, yeah so. that's where it's hottest so that's where your air separation works the best on the chiller is on the return side yeah yeah so the the air separators have some pretty good research that we've got if you have questions on it you can always call or email me after this but on the return side with that combination air and dirt cleffy did a lot of research on that you know, the, the difference in how many passes before it gets the entrained air out, it's not even worth discussing. It's like a mathematical nut, like not even worth looking at. Um, but as Max and, and Bob had alluded to, like you're giving up a little bit of performance. You're not going to get quite as much air out of the return side, but you definitely don't want a horror story of that previous slide where you put it on the supply side and you just let all that muck from the cast iron piping end up in our boiler and, and now we've got a problem. There yeah. may be a good guideline for that is what type of system you're putting it on. If you're putting it on an old iron pipe, cast iron radiator, steel boiler, cast iron boiler system, you're probably more concerned about the dirt than you are. You're going to get the air regardless of what side it's on eventually. Yeah. You won't get it quickly on the return, but boy, you don't want that crap going in your boiler the very yeah. first day you turn it on or your pump. So maybe the return is your better location on an old dirty system. It's a brand new PEX and copper system, I would say, on the supply side. So maybe that can help you decide. Yeah, it's it's tricky. I can tell you, we don't do a lot of air and dirt. If I really get into a crunch where I'm tight on space, I'm doing a separator, right? It's got my air and dirt. It's replacing my closely spaced tees. It's a packaged unit. Like on smaller diameter, like one inch, I might be $40 more than the individual components, but what's my time worth? It's press. So I make four press joints. It's done. On larger sizes, anything over two inch, which we do a lot of, that combination unit is actually less money than you doing individual parts to it when you account for it. Forget the labor, you've got to bolt that thing in. Like doing the commercial ones with the flanges on it, that's not a get a press tool out and get it done in five minutes. Yeah, I mean, with the press, you could have those four connections pressed before you even got your first fitting warm to do 12 connections to do air, dirt, and closely spaced tees. So it yeah. depends on yeah. how. How expensive the labor rate is, and I imagine in the GTA area that it's uh, well, the, the larger issues is do you have the manpower? The, the biggest struggle that we see is the shortage of manpower. What yeah. I like about the the Kalefi product, what I like about IBC, what I like about Rayhow is they have products that they might cost a little bit money more money, except for IBC. Their stuff is actually lower than everybody else, which is kudos to them, the good Canadians there, right? But even if you're paying a little bit more money for a SEP4 versus doing separate air and dirts. You know, you don't have the manpower. So if you can do things faster and more efficiently, if I can do that boiler retrofit in half a day instead of a day, or I can do it in a day with one guy instead of two, you know, it makes a makes a big difference. Or yeah. prefab the whole left side of the system on some plywood at your shop and listen to the radio and hundred percent. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We have we have guys that'll come into our lab. We've got nice big work tables. They'll come in, they'll actually use our press tools, they'll assemble the whole thing. It's it's a lot of fun because our tech team is there and they can chat and have a good time. And 
you know, I, I'm not sure if it's faster when we're chatting, but if anything, we get to learn something from our contractor and engineering partners. Uh, it's good to see what they're doing and hopefully we can instill a little bit of knowledge as well. So we're going to go into the danger land before we move on to a heat pump retrofit. So we're going to talk a little bit about what if we wanted to put some in-floor heating in. So I've dropped the manifold in here. So we want to try and do this, you know, as least disruptively to the entire system as possible. So probably the easiest way that we could do that would actually be to drop in a couple of closely spaced tees. Uh, and then from there, we're going to actually feed into this manifold. Max, do you want to just sort of walk through why this is probably a better route than doing it any other way? You're taking it out of, it's still temperature wise, it's in series, but you don't have to go through the radiant to get to the rest of your radiators, which is going to completely screw up your flow considerations if those are monofloor tees. So this way with a separate pump and we're hydraulically separated here, this, what you just drew there is a wheel that's spinning at its own speed. Um, so it is going to, you know, bring some colder water back into the return there that you're going to have to take through the rest of the system. But as far as, you know, completely screwing up the, uh, that P2 uh, pumping, it's not going to affect that the same way that it would if you went through the radiant first in series. Um, and it just, that may come up to temperature quicker or more slowly than the rest of the system too. So it, it'd be nice to have that on its own pump that can uh, be a different zone. Too. And you might put that primary or secondary on the return coming back to that boiler and use the temperature after it's going through the yeah. radiator, especially That's if you can point. run that radiant at 120 degree supply instead of 140 and 110 you know, return or something like that. Your water is already coming back from your last radiator at what temperature I can't quite see it. So you might want to... Yeah. And that would help your boiler, you know, get your boiler return temperature as low as possible, yeah. so it condenses more and yeah. maximizes the efficiency of it. So, you know, you can play a lot of different games with this. There's not just one exact way that you have to do it. You got to kind of look at every job and see what the goal is, what temperatures you're going to drop through that system, you know, where you can physically get this into the system to make it happen. There's there's a few different ways that that could be uh, that subsystem could be piped into it. Yeah, I'm showing the head path again here so you can see what we're trying to achieve. We're trying to make sure this doesn't mix with any of this piping. Um, we are doing this quickly. So obviously, yeah, we would like to be on the return side, the coolest water temperature. You don't want to be feeding 140 unless it's a staple up. And even then we're going to question, you don't need 140. But this is more just to illustrate some basics. Obviously, if you get into a job like this, call us. You know, that, that's what we do. Um, you can reach out to our technical team. We'll put you together a CAD drawing and explain why we're doing it that way. Every system is different. The thing that the three of us wanted you to understand is that we are hydraulically separating this. We want to make sure anything we're adding on the secondary side doesn't interfere with any other kind of piping. And then we obviously have to be very careful about the temperature cascade on the system. So before we move on, obviously we've got this bo boiler programmed at 140 supply. Just be conscious of what that means on that last rack. Yeah, right, that, that water temperature is going to start to drop dramatically. One of the handouts that you guys have got is called the sizing rad output handout. So what that does is it uh, gives you the rules for calculating, well, that rad that was 180, I've now got 120 water feeding it. What's that output going to look like? Right? Do you need to throw a panel rad in? Do you need to do something differently? Uh, in a lot of cases, those rads are gigantic. They probably are able to heat that room at the newer water temperature, but don't just go into it and start turning water temperatures down and kind of go, okay, uh, you know, it is what it is. I've got a cascade or, or worse yet, not understand that in this piping arrangement, you're going to lose water temperature as we drop down through the system. Yeah, another way to do that, uh, Michael, would be just like you did with your indirect earlier, take it parallel off the boiler and don't even put it on that secondary loop side. Just tee it in on the other side. Then it can be whatever it wants to be. It could even be prioritized. Yeah, right. Yeah, take it right off there, and then then your whole issue because you're. I'm just worried about your series temperature drop when you take it off the side, on the uh, secondary side of the hydraulic separator. So yeah, just put it right there. And yeah, so you, you could also yeah. come over here, and you don't. You could even have it priority opt out. Uh, yeah. It would do the same thing as the indirect. So I'm just going to drop a circulator in. So yeah. in this scenario, same thing. When this pump comes on, the IBC boiler is smart enough to say this pump doesn't run. Um, you know, the other way that we could do it uh, is we could simply drop in a uh, closely twin T. I'm going to pick the return side yep. and uh, we could re reproduce the same thing going down into that manifold. So yep. Yep. a Look. lot of different ways to get around it. We just more or less want you to understand the potential heartache you can get into here uh, as we move on. 
I know there's a ton of questions I didn't get to when I was doing this drawing, but don't worry. We're going to answer all the questions as we sort of move along. Um, if you guys are good, I, I think we're going to flip over and we're going to talk about uh, the heat pump setup for a little bit. Okay. So Max, let's. Uh, why don't you take a stab at this one and we'll, we'll have a little discussion of what we're going to do next on the heat pump application. Sure. So now we're back to 2021 and we want to put in kind of the the newest uh, stuff that's in the, the Eden warehouse right now. Uh, a couple different things here instead of the you know potential to do 180 degrees. Not that we you know do much of that anymore with a good design. Uh, we're not going to have that anymore with the water to water heat pump, but that's fine. We just have to be designing for lower temperatures and we've got a good complement of things here with something like a TurboMax for domestic hot water. You can see the amount of copper inside of that reverse indirect. That's gonna allow us to still uh, make DHW with a lower supply temperature from the heat pump. And then also like the, the Rao, uh, Rao panel, that's uh, great for really low temperature radiant, uh, even in a retrofit type scenario. Yeah, the big thing you need to be conscious of is that this TurboMax that's being used, that's no mistake. Uh, a typical water to water or air to water unit, you got to watch your leaving water temperatures on the units. So a lot of people are used to boilers that can put out 180, no problem. You know, there, there is no water to water product that can put out 180. Um, there is a unit that's called the Opti Heat that can produce 140 degree water, but understand that the further we drive the supply water temperature from the ground loop temperature, the lower we reduce the savings and the performance of that unit. So. What's nice about this TurboMax is it's not storing potable water. The potable water runs through that coil, so in about seven seconds, they can lift that water from 50 degrees to uh, 105 degrees. Like it, it's really, really effective. The other thing you gotta be aware of, it's, it's a head loss issue. And we're gonna talk about that and we're gonna show that uh, in our next uh, drawing exercise. Of there is a significant amount of head loss in that system where you're gonna run into problems with it working properly. Um, the 0026, the reason we like to use that circulator, that's basic. well, it is uh, a 0013 ECM, so it, it's good. It would replace like a 2699F. It's got a lot of functionality to it. The reason we're not using a 0015 here is a 0015 is nowhere near big enough to take care of this unit. And again, whether it's a water-to-water -water or air-to-water, this is the same conversation we're having. As Max alluded to, we have both in our warehouse. We love both. You know, we don't have a preference. Um, for my own house, I'm looking at air to water because I live in the city. Can't put a ground loop in. I'm sure we have a lot of the, you know, a couple hundred people that joined us tonight. I'm sure some of you can't put a ground loop in. So what we're talking about here uh, applies the same across the board. These TurboMax tanks, they also come with two extra ports on them. So you could also use it as your indirect and your buffer tank. So just keep that in mind. Where that doesn't work or where you're not using uh, a TurboMax, with a water to water piece of equipment, you need to have a buffer tank on that. And we're gonna talk a little bit as we go further into that. Um, the unit we're gonna use for our drawing purposes, but again, it'll apply to a lot of units. I'm picking an NSW 060. Uh, I wanted to put this up so everybody can understand. Typically when people see an NSW 060, uh, they look at the ability of that unit. So that's this unit right here. That unit's putting out you know, about 58,000 BTUs. And people look at that and go, okay, great. I can put three quarter inch piping on that, no problem. The part that's being missed is right here. This is the ideal flow rate that unit wants. That's 22 and a half gallons a minute, right? Uh, the minimum flow rate we want to see is 18 gallons a minute. The mistake we see happening on this equipment is they see these numbers and they think they're selectable. Just because it's in a chart, they go, well, it starts at nine and it works its way to 22 and a half. It sort of comes back to Errol's comment about the 12 pipe or the 12 inches of spacing. This is the same conversation. I've cropped out a small piece of a manual. You either read the whole manual to find out that this is for open loop, or you pipe the whole thing in and discover it's never going to work and you got to start over. It, it does happen quite a bit. So read through the manual, or better yet, save reading the entire manual, call our office. Uh, speak with Matt, who's a, our sales engineer. He's a PN. Speak with Cody. Speak with myself. We've got a whole team. We're happy to talk about it. But really, the big takeaway we wanted you to understand is that the minimum flow on this unit is 19 gallons a minute uh, at 15 feet ahead. And that is significant flow and head loss uh, on this piece of equipment. Looking at the TurboMax, uh, again, so this is a TurboMax. I'll just erase my... Uh, 
So uh, it's a reverse indirect. It doesn't store potable water, which is great. Uh, using the heat pump that we're looking at, you're going to get about 129 gallons per hour. And so what this table is, is this is just a table that shows at the different BTUs. Most people are used to going up here. I've got 300,000 BTUs. My first hour, I'm going to get 592 gallons. So if you look at the brochure from TurboMax, all these lower numbers aren't on it. So you got to be careful. You can't size a TurboMax based off boiler data or boiler temperatures. In our case, we're down to 50,000 BTUs. It works out to be about five gallons a minute continuous in the 50 to 60,000 BTUs, which is good for most homes. The other thing that the TurboMax has a big advantage over is because of the massive amount of coils inside of here, the first hour on this unit would be very comparable to an indirect with a big enough coil. Really, the thing that makes the difference is the continuous draw. Um, you're really hard pressed outside of thermal, which makes the TurboMax, to find a manufacturer that makes a good quality unit with a big enough coil surface inside of it. If you were just to throw a regular indirect onto this unit, it is not going to work. Bob, any experience with the TurboMax or perhaps one of the different products I might not have mentioned? I know I'm a fan of the TurboMaxes, but I'm, I'm sure there's other vendors that are out there. Yeah, there's not too many reverse indirect. There used to be another one in the U.S. that was similar to that, but I don't see them around anymore. But that, I mean, it's just a, a lot of copper in there. Copper's a great conductor, number one, and there's a lot of it in there. That's why it's just a huge surface area and a good conductor is why they can, they're so powerful. It's a pretty... Uh, uh, amazing heat exchanger is really what it is is a heat exchanger so yeah and you can't yeah, near a, a regular indirect in and keep the same system there which you've kind of described in the you know, in more detail yeah. but this is a this is a different animal than just a standard indirect tank yeah, and yeah. allow you to build this type of system these are good units right because it's literally just a volume of water that that water to water unit is looking at like if, if you put a turbo max in instead of a standard indirect, like you'd be amazed what a 109 can do. Like the, the 109 with you know 300,000 BTUs going through it, no house needs that. Where there's a big disconnect is people will look at, I've got an 80 gallon indirect I'm taking out. So they'll put a 109 turbo max into it, not realizing that thing's got twice the power. So usually people will look at it and go, the turbo max is too much money. I don't want to use it. Well, the reality is you shouldn't have been using a 109. You should have looked at a TurboMax 65, which is significantly less money, um, you know, and, and works well in that boiler application. Uh, the only two TurboMaxes that we would use in a heat pump application would be the 65 and the 109. Uh, they basically have the same first hour. Uh, they have a slightly different continuous on it. But for the different gains, I would do the less expensive of the two options so that we've got it. Um, Eric had had the question, do we have any heat pump handouts? We do. Um, so one of the handouts that I had attached is uh, a handout on uh, hydronics with geothermal. So you can download that handout as one of the ones we have there. Um, obviously, when we're done this presentation, we'll go through the questions, answer all of the questions. But if you walk away from this and have some heat pump questions, again, we've, we've got a technical team in-house. They're happy to take your calls. and uh, Or you can shoot us an email, and we're, we're happy to work with you on a design. And, and answer any sort of questions that you might have. So with that in mind, we're gonna go back to our, uh, our CAD setup and uh, we're gonna come down here and uh, we're gonna have a little bit of a discussion as to how this works. So right off the bat, you'll notice I'm showing a buffer tank on this. So the reason that I'm showing this buffer tank on the heat pump um, is this buffer tank is required. So if you look at heat pump operation, we want to make sure that unit runs for 10 to 15 minutes to maximize its overall performance. And the reality is that if we were to fire this boiler without that buffer tank, it's not going to run very long, right? If we only have one TRV open, that, that water to water unit or that air to water unit, especially if it's not variable speed, is just going to bang on and bang off. So the general rule of thumb is you want to have one to two gallons of storage for every thousand BTUs. Um, there's more calculations where you can use your floor as part of your load calculator, your total buffer. You have to be careful. There's not a lot of storage. If you've got cast rads, then as, as Bob would say, you've got tons of storage. But, you know, if you've just got PEX piping in the floor or worse yet, you've got PEX piping with zoning, you can't count that as, as part of the buffer of the system. So the other thing that you want to be very conscious of is that this water to water doesn't have the ability to lift the water 30 degrees right those units they typically lift the water five to eight degrees 
So what will end up happening is on, on this side of the system, you might be lifting the water from, you know, a, a 120 to 128. And on this side of the system, on the secondary, you'd be running at a, a 20 degree delta T. Max, any insights to add to that as I complete our piping here? One of the things that we get asked is, uh, is a hydro separator a buffer tank? Um, and uh, it's primary secondary, but it's not enough volume. So if you have a four port buffer tank like that, it still has the ability to do the hydraulic separation. It just gives you the extra battery, the extra volume that you need uh, for a heat pump, or if you wanted to use that in the boiler system too. So same function, uh, but much, much bigger volume required to keep your equipment happy. So in this case, you do a buffer tank and then you just do separate air and dirt separators and that would work great. So, Yeah, so a couple things to point out and, and Bob and I were talking pre-webinar about this. Just because you draw something, you, you can draw whatever you want. So there's some things that I've drawn here that have auto-calculated that are wrong, right? So we just talked about this is a five ton unit and I said you want one to two gallons per thousand BTUs. Uh, you can see it's calculating an 18.7 gallon buffer tank. So uh, quick math with no calculators, that number's out to launch, it's wrong. So be conscious of, of what is being put out. The other thing to be aware of is you can see we're, we're showing that we can do 140 with this unit, which we can't do. Um, and again, you know, software is great at assisting you, uh, but like with anything, find a good mentor. I know I've got lots of them. Bob and Max are great mentors to me as well. They can sort of guide you through what's going on. Pay attention to what has happened here with head loss. Our, our head loss on this system is significantly high. If we were to tie an indirect directly to this, we're gonna end up wanting to move 20 gallons a minute at you know 30 or 40 feet ahead. And the reality is we can't do that. This head loss number is actually understated. 20 gallons a minute, it's closer to 19 feet of head going through this unit. Um, comes back to the earlier question of could I have run PEX here? Whew, I'd be super nervous about it. These units, if you look at the manufacturer's guideline, they say right in their manual that what pipe size they want. It's typically inch and a half. And a lot of guys look at that and go, well, I, I run three quarter inch pecs, it's not going very far. Well, if, if you wanna drive these numbers through the roof, a great way to do it is to start running pecs through this unit. Um, these are compressor bearing units, so just be aware. You don't ever wanna run pecs piping directly to a compressor on a unit. Um, if it ever failed and the system was to flash to steam, you'd find out really quickly your off-ground PEX pipe will rupture pretty quickly. Uh, and we've seen that over the years. Uh, Max and I are, are Rahel fanboys. Yeah, their pipe is a few pennies more afoot. It's true. But if you look at their temperature burst rating compared to some of the other products coming to the market, it's huge. So we won't name any other brands, but you know that's, that's sort of the insights on it. Bob, do you have any thoughts on that as we move along? No, I think you're spot on with everything there. It's just, you know, be aware of your pressure drop going through there and the buffer. You've got to have a buffer, whether it's an air to water or water. What you just, it's just, the buffer is a supersized uh, hydraulic separator. So you're kind of getting two functions when you put a buffer in there. If it's like this one with a four port, you're, you're getting your air removal there also. So, yeah. So I'm just going to uh, turn a couple of things on here. So you can see that. Uh, calculated at 20 gallons a minute, no surprise, we're inch and a half pipe at 3.2 feet per second. I'm pretty happy with that. Um, just because we're inch and a half on the primary side though, doesn't mean the secondary side is going to stay at inch and a half because on this side of the system, we're actually running at a, a completely different delta T. We can run that secondary side at 20 degrees and the primary side will be running at the eight degrees that we pointed out. Um, the other thing to pay attention to as well is that, again, just because this tank has two inch ports on it, Typically on a unit like this, we would do an 80 gallon tank with two inch ports. You don't actually need two inch on that secondary side. You can see that our feet per second, our velocity is so low on that, we can potentially start to introduce problems. Um, any commentary on that, Bob, as I move along? Yeah, you, if you get below two feet per second, it's hard to get air out of a system. The water just won't carry the air along with it when it's moving that slow. Just imagine, you know, a foot, 0.6, uh, you know, the feet per second is you can look at that. So. Uh, and especially if you have vertical piping, what happens is the water and the air run one, away from one another. The air stays at the top radiators in that system. It never gets pushed back. So keep squeezing that pipe size down, which you can do here with this program, until you get up to that at least two feet per second on that on that secondary size number there. Can you do that and see where you get to two feet per second on that? Yeah, right here. Yeah. So I'm going to take it down to... Uh... 
Well, you know what? I'm, I'm going to take it further than that. I'm going to take it on a one inch. Yeah. Pretty good guess. <laughs> General rule of thumb, I mean, it, it doesn't change just because we have a heat bump on this. Uh, I'm typically always sizing to two to four feet per second. Um, I think Robert's got a higher number, but I think the three of us are two to four feet per second, generally speaking. Yeah, I mean, that's the rule of thumb, two to four. I know Robert Bean says, oh, five's okay, but right around five, it can start to get noisy, especially in metallic pipe. If you have copper pipe, you get water flowing through there at five feet per second or more than five feet per second. You start to hear that hissing, that kind of, especially if you got a lot of elbows or somebody didn't read in the pipe and you got a lot of turbulence in there. Yeah, five feet per second is probably the high side limit. But if you have to squeeze it to that to get a system to perform right or for an indirect um, fast recovery, you can, you could go there. But four is comfortable. Yeah. So really, the big takeaway on this one that we want to show is understanding this temperature. So I'm coming into this unit at 114 degrees, I'm leaving at 120. I could be a little higher than that. That's a little, you know, it's middle of the road from a Delta T standpoint. But what that means on the secondary side, and, and I've been to jobs after the fact, I'd rather be involved up front, is that down here, you're gonna start to run into some significant temperature cascades. So I'm just gonna quickly tweak this and I'm gonna show you. So here, we're now leaving this unit at 120. Again, you can't always trust the software. Sometimes you gotta go and correct it. So you can see that our, our first rad, you may have looked at the D rating on it and said, yeah, you know what, at 120, they put new insulation in, we can heat this room. Okay, but as Bob alluded to, it's that average water temperature. That first one might be at 120, but the last one is actually around 90 degrees. And I got called to a job that was piped exactly like this, and it wasn't a retro, it was a new install. They just did a bunch of closely spaced tees. So you have to be careful. When you're putting a heat pump in, any scenario with a heat pump, make sure you're getting guidance. You know, I, I know in our case, we have a very good technical team. You know, if you ever are dealing with them and don't agree, call me and tell me. But Matt Urban on our team is a very good engineer. He will make sure you don't get into this situation. Uh, ditto for Cody and myself on our team. We'll walk you through, here's the things that you need to be aware of. I would not be excited in a cast rad situation at 120 degrees if you didn't have a discussion up front and get a little bit more details on what has changed in this house since 1950 or whatever the number is. Yeah, or if you luck out and use your sizing chart and find a much bigger radiator somewhere. Yeah, and we did, I don't know if you attached 10 times the radiator. this issue, but this is an excellent issue that we wrote specifically for people that are starting to use these air to water heat pumps. What do I have to do in my distribution system to be able to use you know, an air to water heat pump where I'm not gonna get 180 degrees and you just gotta look at the building, you gotta look yeah. at the type of radiators. You, you know, you almost have to do a heat loss on the building as it stands because things might have changed in there, better windows, better insulation. You know, you gotta start from zero really if you're gonna try and run them at these low supply water temperatures. And to know that maybe you need to add some panel radiators in that that last so zone last or room. the row panel or something like that. But hey, we need more surface area. This this water temperature might do, but not with a, a small cast iron radiator anymore. Yeah, the reality is that we can access this piping and this piping because it's in the mechanical room. We can't always access everything here that's hidden. So I think we've got a minute. So what we're going to do really quickly is I'm going to grab one of these and we're just going to show you if it was a scenario where they're retrofitting what we could potentially do with that. And then I'll let uh, Max and Bob do color commentary. So I'm going to do less rads just because uh, for time, but we're going to say we're going to do three of them. And so what I would end up doing is, uh, it's of course backwards it's going to make it a little tricky for us as I draw, but the way I would typically do that is like this. And there's there's one key to how I'm doing this that uh, I'm sure Max and Bob already know where I'm going to go with this. Let's make sure I don't cross any supply and return lines here, Max. So I would typically do it like this, and then uh, you can do it with one circulator and zone valves. But I'm I'm going to throw some 0015s on this uh, just for the sake of showing it. And so the critical part of this is again coming back to what Bob was saying. It's in this piping right here. So what I'm gonna to do to this piping is I'm gonna upsize the diameter on that piping to do the opposite of what we just did a second ago. So I'm gonna drive down that velocity under two feet per second. Ooh, that's a bit low though, eh, Bob? <laughs> so 
what's happening here is I'm going to feed this with, uh, well, this is half inch. We don't, we don't need much. So we definitely could have done a zone valve, but that's fine. Uh, this piping here, I'm not so concerned. I want to make sure my velocity is in that two to four feet per second. Um, we're there, uh, a little low. And on this piping, all of this piping here that's common to these pumps, I want to make sure that I keep it under two feet per second. So if this is half inch piping here, this might be one inch piping. Yeah, that's just an extension of your low loss header, your hydraulic separator, that pipe going across there. Because what you've done here essentially is you put your loads in parallel instead of series. So every one of those is gonna get the exact same supply water temperature when they're parallel like this. But like you say, you gotta make sure that piping's big enough to supply all those zones now when they're, when they're, um, you know, they're piped in parallel now instead of series. Yeah, so the key is this piping here has to be under two feet per second and it can't be too long. So if this piping that I've highlighted is 30 feet long, you've now got pressure drop through. You've made a mistake. Like this entire piping I'm showing, if it's under five feet, I'm a, I'm a happy guy. So under five feet, size for less than two feet per second. And what happens is this pump, this pump, and this pump can't see each other because what we've just done is what Bob said earlier. I've built a SEP4, mind you, I don't have air and dirt, and it's just sideways and I've got all my pumps coming off of it. So this is really easy. Compared to if I did closely spaced T's, I would need an extra pump on the system. In fact, let's just draw one with closely spaced T's so everybody can see it. If I did closely spaced T's on here, uh, dropping in a T, and then we just copy one of these over. If I just did this, I, I've got a little bit of a problem. Without a pump right here, I've actually nothing's happening. Yeah. So the, the nice part of piping it like this, like I'm showing, is it's less pumps. It's actually quite easy to do. And it's the KISS method. It comes back to the discussion that Cody and I have all the time. This is easily reproducible. The general rule of thumb to get under two feet per second, and Bob and Max will let you comment on this as well, is if you're feeding the system with half inch pipe, and if you go up a pipe size, it typically gets your velocity down to under two feet per second. Personally, I just like to calculate it. Bob, what are your thoughts on that general rule of thumb? There's plenty of charts and apps for your phone and everything that you can get that answer exactly. So the other thing, what you've done here, when you put that first load like that on that primary secondary, you've lowered the temperature okay, to the other. Again, yeah. yeah, you got a series now because now the next, the second and the third load aren't going to get 100 and uh, what's it leaving there, 120 anymore because that return from that first closely spaced T's is dropping the temperature. So if the radiators on this two, you know, second and third loop can handle that, that's fine. But that's what happens when you start uh, blending through a closely spaced tease instead of pulling your loads off a of parallel. Yeah. So the first way you drew it, each of the three zones has equal yeah. opportunity to get 120 degrees or whatever. Where now degrees. it the first baseboard gets 120, and then the other two zones two and three on the right uh, can get 100. They maybe. could both get 100, maybe. Um, but uh, you've you've kind of uh, derated that that second and third zone a little bit. The supply water temperature to the next ones has been lowered. Yeah. Maybe now if that first zone isn't running, yeah, the second yeah, and the, third are going to get you know one four. What are you leaving there? One twenty. Yeah. But as soon as that one kicks on, all of a sudden now the next two are on a design day. Your next yeah. two are aren't going to make rooms are cold now. So you're going to get a phone call. On yeah. The, on the design. Well, well let's, let's say this is the guest bedroom. Right? and this is the rest of the house, you're going to have a really fun one. You're going to get a phone call every 14 months when the mother-in-law comes to stay with you to go, the heating system's only screwed up when the mother-in-law's here. This is actually a good joke now that I think about it. Well, it's your mother-in-law's fault, clearly, right? Because yeah. she's staying in this guest bedroom, which, do you like that, Bob? <laughs> you know, this so is this just... pump's only on when the mother-in-law's there, so it's only happening when she is there. And you can yeah. see the difference. Like, if you look at what these water temperatures are doing, I've got a significant cascade between this one and this one. This one's being fed with 120. This one's getting 113. You'll notice both of these are getting the same temperature because these way they're piped, they can't see each other. I've built a short, fat header, whereas doing closely spaced T's, you've got a temperature drop. And again, remember, you've got to have a pump here in order for this to work. The yeah. really painful part is if you did that, by putting this pump here, you've now caused a problem with these because you've actually got two pumps in series for part of your system. And the other part of it, well, yeah, it's so the takeaway is don't do this. If you, if you look at it uh, from a cost standpoint, even if it's a boiler, what's easier and more cost effective? Doing this, which is a short, fat piece of pipe, and 
two zone balls and a small pump or two small pumps, or doing closely spaced tees and pumps and dealing with a temperature cascade. This, this to me is the simplest way to do it. If you've ever been to our training, we do with John Siegenthaler, which we do every year. You won't see him doing anything but this. This is a KISS method anybody can reproduce. Um, you know, obviously any questions on this, if you have a specific job you want to talk about, you know, you can ask a question or you can email or call us afterwards and we can certainly talk some more about this. So at that point, I, I think that we've kind of covered everything. I've got one last thing before we get into more, some more questions and I may do some drawing as the questions get asked. We're gonna do a giveaway for a couple of Visa gift cards. So we've got $200 Visa gift cards. The three of us were discussing it and we've decided that the way we're gonna do this draw is we want you to send us some really cool photos. So the cool photos, you can send them to my email. It's michael at edenenergy.com. You can send me a really cool install that you did. You can send me a really old install. You send me whatever you think is neat. It can be a total debacle, like a giant mess you found, or it can be an install that you think is the coolest thing ever. When you email me, just include your name, your company, and your phone number so I know how to get back to you. And please use the email you registered for this. So we can say, okay, yeah, this is somebody who attended. And then in the next week, the three of us are gonna look at these really cool photos, and we're, we're gonna pick three that we think are neat or interesting and uh, we'll, uh, we'll let you guys know. We'll probably let everybody know. Uh, we're on Instagram. Uh, we're also on YouTube under Eden Energy Equipment. So you can check us out there. You can see some crazy install photos pretty much daily, good and bad, uh, on our social media. Um, not gonna do any parting words though, because we're gonna answer some questions now before we, uh, we jump offline and uh, see that we get most of the stuff addressed that's come up. Um, so right off the bat, we've got uh, Joshua who's saying he actually grew up in a house built in 1912 uh, and he can still remember how warm that house was with those old monoflow tees and that gravity system. Yeah, I lived in Chicago for a while and a lot of the, the older apartments and the older buildings, man, those radiators were so boiling hot that <laughs> you had to be careful you didn't brush into that on the way to the bathroom in the middle of the night or something like that. It's a nice yeah. heat. It's a nice, uh, gentle, comfortable heat. Yeah. Yeah, you have to be careful. If you look at the building code, there is a requirement for maximum surface temperature now. Um, I was fortunate, Tom Gervais, the VP of Lars, if you're listening, Tom, hello, I know he's supposed to be here. Uh, we were doing a job uh, that was getting retrofitted where they were heating 180 degrees in the rads. And Tom and I and, and Patrick Scannelbury ended up talking about it. And Tom threw his hand up and went, you better be careful. Here's what the building code says. You got to be careful with service temperatures. Just because it was like that before doesn't mean under 2020 or 2021 building code that it's still acceptable. So again, reach out, have a discussion with us before you start these jobs. And we'll do our very best to you know, tick most of the boxes we're aware of and uh, try to help to get you through that. Two things um, happen. A few things happen with cast iron radiators when you start to lower the water temperatures. They actually give off heat by all three methods, conduction, convection, and radiation. They're big radiators, like a radiant floor heat. But if you start lowering the temperature, you don't get the air convection through them. You don't move as much heat out through the convection like a fin tube. Depends on the cold air coming in the bottom, the hot water, heating up the fin and going out the top. So when you start hitting them with 140, yeah, you take an, out, an output hit on them. So you just got to know that. And, compensate and calculate that. Yeah, Clement's got a good question. He's asking about the concept of the air in the radiators to act as your expansion tank. And he's uh, got some good questions of how much noise do you think that would cause, Bob? Yeah, and so here was the biggest issue when they started doing that. And this was one of Dan Holohan's story. He went to this job and they couldn't figure out why they put in these new booster pumps and the system wasn't working properly. Is because you had multiple expansion tanks in the system. Every one of those radiators became a pump point of no it, pressure yeah. change. And the pump had no idea where to reference its, you know, pumping away points. So then you had to go back and bleed those radiators and put an expansion tank in. So, yeah, I mean... You just got to know that those radiators, if they're full of air, they're expansion vessels and uh, they can complicate the system. So I don't Yeah, so to Bob's point, if I've got my circulator here and we're going to say these two are cast rads and I've got a foot of air on the top of those, all the head energy this pump is generating, it's not much here because it's just a booster pump. Well, it's ending up in that rad and then you run into why is there no heat here, here or here? That's why you saw that cushion tank in the earlier drawing that's at the top 
it's yeah. making sure that the if there is a booster pump, you know, we're we're not to his point going, what's going on here? Where why is my pump not working properly? Why am I not getting heat in the system? Yeah. Um, let's see here. Oh, cleaners. Alan has a good comment on cleaners. Um, what do you recommend from the standpoint of an old system like this? If you were going to, uh, you're, you're taking it out and you're doing our second drawing, you're uh, going to put a condensing boiler in. I'm going to scroll down a little bit. So we're doing this, Bob, what would you do from a flushing and cleaner standpoint to, before we get this beautiful SL boiler tied in? Yeah. I mean, that, of all the things I've read over the years about monoflow teas, the biggest um, downside is it's hard to purge them because there's no valve between those closely spaced teas. In fact, there's a guy on Heating Health that's been on there for two years trying to get his monoflow tea system to purge out and to flush properly. You just, yeah, I mean, you just, you know, the best thing you do is just have a, you know, a lot of flow going through. If you have a booster pump or a, you know, a fill pump or something like a half horsepower pump that can pump 12, 15 gallons per minute, maybe put it on the secondary side of that separator and just, you know, blast as much flow through there as you can and try and you know, flush all that air through. Now, if the radiators have shutoff valves, some way you can isolate one at a time, that would help. But that that's a hard thing to, to purge them out because it's all one big open piping circuit that the water is seeing, really. And it's not your system pump. Yeah, your That's pump, a different yeah. curve. So then you're going to be enough. able to purge that system well. So whatever the, the size pump for normal operation is, isn't going to have that velocity to carry the debris because that's closer to what like eight or ten feet per second that you need to really like move bulk dirt yeah. through a system and your you either miss the boat with your system pump sizing and it's way oversized or it just isn't going to be fast enough to to get the garbage out of there yeah it's usually somewhere around six feet per second velocity when you can start moving solids through a pipe there's a company in texas that does that professionally they go out and purge problematic usually big commercial jobs like big ground loops and stuff and they say right around six feet per second is when dirt and tools and phones and stuff phones, start yeah, flushing gloves. out of big yeah. pipes when they get to them they said the guy that put it in never had that kind of horsepower to move that kind of flow yeah. to get that kind of velocity to scrub all that stuff out of there and that would be true of the air in those t's so if you have a little you know fill pump of some sort i don't know if you guys sell those up at eden energy but a lot of guys have those little little giant or liberty or something a little you know fill pump but an old swimming pool pump works great for that because they move a lot of gpm and you can just blast it through there really yeah so i've got a video walk through the job i was at today that'll go up on instagram if anybody wants to see the color commentary it looks an awful lot like the system we're talking about today what i had suggested to them is I want four ball valves put into it, but they're ball valves with drain. And what they're gonna do is they're gonna close these two valves so that everything on the left-hand side of the SEP4 is, is isolated. And then yeah. what they're gonna do is they're gonna flush this at at least five feet per second. Uh, Bob makes a great point at six feet. At four feet, it's not gonna do anything. To Max's point, this 0015 on one inch pipe, it's only generating 2.3 feet per second. If you're using these pumps for purging, I hope you got a spare pump because it's going to be screwed, but it, it, it's not going to work. It doesn't carry the velocity. So if these are, are turned off and these are turned off, you can flush through here. You can put some Addy chemical cleaner in. I'm a big fan of the Addy. We stock it for all different applications, whether it's burner cleaning or, or water flushing. Some of the chemicals, you can actually go in uh, and put it into the system for up to 30 days. So we can circulate through here with the booster pump these valves will be turned, so it's not going through that old boiler because we don't care about it. Uh, and then you come back and, and flush that all out and fill the system with good water. The reason I've got these two shown over here uh, is it gives me the ability down the road to, to take care of this boiler. I can clean these, clean these, turn these two ball valves, pardon me, and I can flush that heat exchanger, especially if uh, we accidentally filled it with uh, tap water at 500 parts per million. Um, the other question that had come up was, how do we handle the situation from the standpoint of filling it? I'm a big fan of the Pure Pals. Um, it, it's a really low cost way of doing it. Uh, it's just a cylinder that you hook a garden hose up to one end, the other end goes into the system, and it has a color changing resin on it. That's only good for residential jobs. You're never going to use that for a commercial job unless you've got 20 of them with you. Um, Calafi has a product that's too, Max. Do you want to talk about the hydrofill a little bit? Yeah, and so we have uh, replacement bags for the hydrofill, but it's uh, it's not in the, the catalog anymore. So if you have one, we can still supply the, the bags for it. But similar concept that you can kind of dial your, you know, whatever you want your TDS out to be and you fill through it and then you throttle it until you get to the right TDS. Yeah, right there. 
Um, so a great a great way to maybe use site water to do a residential system or something like that. I would say if you're going commercial, um, I don't know what you guys do for glycol, but if they can pre-mix, uh, you know, whatever 500 gallons of blue, 30% uh, propylene glycol or whatever you're looking for, that's kind of the best case scenario to start with exactly what you're looking for. And then I know that you guys are big fans of glycol feeders, which I love too, instead of just leaving an autofill on so it doesn't fill up the system with site water and, and bring in additional hardness if there's a leak somewhere we want to find that leak just a little yes. tip on, on that fill cart so the company that made that for us we cluppy didn't make that no longer makes that so we can't get them anymore we can get the replacement bags but you know just a little secret at the end of the day it's a window washing unit people that wash commercial windows for a living use a deionizer cart so they don't have to squeegee and dry their windows they dry without spots on them. so you can go online and buy a window washer deionizer cart and that's really what you're going to get or washing a ferrari yeah. or something right? yeah so right the hard water on the car yeah. yeah so so max made a really good point i'm just going to draw that in here because my, my drawing wasn't complete but i don't think anybody thought it was so uh air separator here yeah it's on the supply but it's at the point of no pressure change There's nothing pumping into it i typically do an expansion tank and i do the smallest dmf that i can get my hands on it used to be these dmfs they were expensive and people just assume you got to put glycol in it. It's actually not that much more money to do a DMF these days than to do an autofill. The nice part about it is I can fill that DMF using my PuroPal. So this is that demineralizer we talked about, garden hose on one end. I fill that DMF with good water and I can leave that PuroPal at the homeowner's house. Hey, if this thing ever drops down, just use this, hook a garden hose to it, and you can fill that system up with good water. Uh, these things are not expensive. You know, it's it's not designed to be permanently piped though. Uh, you know, don't don't put it into the system and leave it there. Uh, you'll find this plastic will be nicely ruptured once it builds up some pressure inside of it. But they're a pretty cool unit. They come in a couple of different flavors. Very very inexpensive. Unfortunately, I, I don't work in sales, so I can't tell you what they're worth. But if you call our office, one of the customer service people or the sales people will be happy to fill you in. If I was gonna guess, hundred bucks. And you could use one for a couple of jobs. It's not like you're going to be uh, using it one for every single job. Um, Charles is asking on press on the Kalefi, what sizes are the air and dirt separators available in press? I stock them up to two inch. Are they bigger than that in press? No, no. Two, two inches. Anything that we make in press is up to two inch above that. Like I said, it usually goes to a flanged uh, version. I think you can get flange pressed to yeah. flange adapters, can't you? Probably that would bolt up to it. But yeah, we don't offer. Um, yeah, so that that would be the way to do like big three inch orange press would just be to a flan Kalefi unit. Yeah, yeah, flange to press adapters. Yeah. Yeah. So the the big ones are are pretty impressive. Uh, how big they are, as I say, just uh, this is the SEP four product that we like. This particular one, uh, how tall are you, Max? Six foot. Uh, six three. Yeah, okay, yeah. so this thing's taller than Max is, and you ain't lifting it. Like, it, when it came in, uh, Cody on our tech team came into my office and said, your pickup truck is here, and it's green. And I was on the phone, and I was like, I'm... <laughs> so I got off the phone, and I, I, there's actually a picture on our Instagram of him sitting on it. So if you want to see how big these are, uh, gigantic would be the definition I would use to say, yeah, they're, they're pretty darn big. It's not a, uh, not a small unit. We actually had a bid years ago on a, there was a down in Mexico, Audi was building an assembly plant down there and they asked us to bid a couple 24 inch uh, diameter pipe size hydro separators and it was going to be the size of a semi flatbed. It was going to be that long and that big a diameter to, to handle that whatever 10,000 gallons a minute or whatever there, it was for I guess probably a cooling system at the plant or something. We didn't get the bid, but that's how big that separator was going to be. Well, I knew we were putting a lot of designs in with the big ones because I ended up hearing from Max about it. They're like, hey, you guys have done a few of these this month. And uh, to be clear, we, we just designed them. We didn't actually put them in. Here's a picture of Cody cut off sitting on it. So yeah. it's gigantic. Like this is three of Max's or maybe one and a half of me. <laughs> so yeah. it, it's, it's a big unit. They're, they're really good. They've got air and, and dirt. The dirt's a little bit different. It's got a, a magnetic, uh, I'm going to call it sleeve or poles that go into the bottom of it. Uh, I lost a little sleep for a second when this came in because I don't see the magnet. Uh, I really hope I didn't spec this wrong, but uh, you're seeing that here. These these pull out and they're rods, not sleeves. Pardon me to pull it out. Yeah, you can so. see this is flange. Like you're not you're not pressing that. 
Um, we did this job in Nupi PPR electrofusion. Um, it was probably 40% less than doing it in steel or copper or any other material. And with the electrofusion, you dry fit all the fittings, you hook two probes up, you scan the barcode and you hit start. Like hmm. For this kind of piping, especially with the manpower related issues we have, and it's less money, even than doing it in PVC, it's really a no brainer. Like this yeah. is definitely the way to go with it. Um, we had a good comment come in from Clement. If we couldn't get monoflow tees, could we do closely spaced tees? You could, I think we all agreed. We showed some examples where we could get away with closely spaced tees. But again, all three of us would definitely refer you to this book. Uh, I think I've got the latest edition. Uh, I know Bob, you've got a few editions. <laughs> Um, uh, number four is in the works, but you've got number three there. That's the one you can buy. But Siggy told me they're working on number four. Should be out. I don't know if it's going to be out this year or not. But um, yeah, uh, if you want to learn from the man directly, uh, just keep in touch with us because we do a three-day hydronics course with Siggy every single year. Uh, last year we did it online thanks to COVID. I think this year we'll probably do it online. Um, it's it's a great event. You'll want to get registered early though because we do cap the numbers. Uh, and yeah, it, it's a great turnout. You can't do better than to learn from John Siegenthal. He's one of the few people with my own team. You know, if I ever say something, question it, ask to be validated. I say that to our, our customers as well. John's the one guy, if he says it, don't argue with him. Like he, he'll be happy to get our whiteboard. And I've taken photos of him, you know, longhand calculating without a calculator. And he always starts with, Mike, we can do this. I'm like, man, I need a calculator. It's great that you can do it, but. <laughs> um, Mark has made out the comment. Mark, good to see you, buddy. He's in Guelph. He said, our water in Guelph is terrible. Uh, that's correct, about 500 parts per million. Um, is the dirt mag a good idea for that? Uh, yes, but it doesn't change the fact you still want to put good water into the system. It's yeah. not the be-all, end-all. Bob, you want to add some thoughts? Yeah, you can't. What the Germans told me when I started researching about water quality, they said, fix the water before you put it in your system, because once it's in there, from the day you put it in, it's going to just do bad things to your system. So in Germany, they have a water quality standard, the VDI DIN uh, 2035, forget what the number is. Uh, in the UK now, they have a water quality standard. The US, we just finished up a, a water quality standard that a bunch of us got together, and they're going to ha actually have a a standard down here on what the water needs to be for boilers. But yeah, I mean, I was out in places in Western Canada up somewhere around Prince Albert or wherever Anderson pump is out there. And I don't know how the water even comes out of the faucet up there. It's so hard. It's around yeah. all those gypsum mines and stuff up there. And I mean, people put like $10,000 worth of water conditioning in their houses just to be able to drink the water and use yeah. it in their house for potable water. I said, <laughs> man, can you imagine that taking that out of the tap and putting this like putting liquid concrete in your boilers up there. So it just depends how bad your water is, but you really should know that and fix it. And don't assume that if you test the water tomorrow in one area of your city that it stays like that. You know, water comes from different wells, different times of the year. The yeah. runoff in the spring is going to give you a lot more chlorides because you got all the de-icers in your water now. So you got to keep checking water every time you do a job and just whatever it takes. You know, RO water can work. That's usually a little bit cheaper than uh, demineralized water. If you start talking hundreds and thousands of gallons, just find somebody with a big RO, like a car wash or, a, you know, some company that does large quantities of reverse osmosis water. Yeah, you want to be really careful with water. Um, you know, the, the example I would use is if I'm, if I'm smoking a dirty cigar and, and Max and Bob are sitting in the room with me, I mean, they can put a filter on their head and attempt to filter the air as they're breathing my secondhand smoke. The reality is they need to just take me and throw me out of the room, right? And it's the same thing with, with bad water quality. We have to do it right. I'll caution on getting chemically treated water. It, it can be good, but you have to be careful. Mechanically processed water, especially if you demineralize it, we've been involved in jobs. We had one recently where the contractor called and his water was eating every steel component in that unit. And what it is, is they listen to people like Bob and myself and Max talk and go, oh, I'm going to get treated water. And they get mechanically treated water, uh, mechanically treated demineralized water, which is not the same as some of the stuff you might drink. Uh, and it's literally extracting the materials out of the pumps, out of the boiler. You can end up with a giant expensive mess. The reality is it's simple. Use a PuroPal or use a similar product to PuroPal. It's very low cost. If it's a commercial high rise, which we do a lot of those now, don't do the water, right? Subcontract that out to a professional company that does it. 
It's way easier than trying to truck in water. We've tried both with our contractor and engineering partners. Reality is, let the water be somebody else's problem. They're gonna need a water contract anyways in the building to take care of it and chemically treat it every year. So I would encourage you to uh, pass that work off. If you use RO water, it's gonna be a low pH water, probably in the fours or fives. You gotta buffer that up a little bit with some of the chemicals that you sell there. If you're gonna use any kind of water that's been taken down to 99% pure, this is gonna be aggressive water and you probably wanna buffer that up with some corrosion inhibitor, which isn't a bad thing to have in your system regardless we got a, a wholesaler that we work with in michigan that actually sells water he'll sell five or 55 gallon barrels to contractors just back into his loading dock and he'll he treats the water at his uh warehouse there and just sends it out to your job site for you so i feel like i should find out who those contractors are and save them some grief and sell them some pure bows. <laughs> but your chicago friend won't like me <laughs> um Jacob's asking the question, is it a good idea to replace an old non-condensing boiler uh, with a ModCon? And if so, what are the things to look out for? Well, I'm going to let Bob comment on this. Let me pull the drawing up. Uh, it's definitely a good idea for a whole bunch of reasons, not least of which is overall system efficiency. The only thing I will comment before I pass this off to Bob and Max, so this is our system where I've retrofitted it. I can in fact have 180 degree water going out here and still bring my return water temperature down where I can make a condensing boiler work. This delta T on this side of the system doesn't always have to correlate with what the delta T on this system. We can pipe it creatively where it's not an issue. Bob, what are your thoughts on going from non-condensing to a mod con and things to pay attention to? Well, it really depends on the distribution side and what temperature water that it requires. If you need 170 degrees, let's say, at that last radiator, you're probably not going to be condensing in that boiler at those kind of temperatures because even blending at the hydro separator, you're, you're not going to get down to that, what, 120 or whatever you need to condense in that boiler. So you might not be getting the efficiency out of that boiler. Now, I'm talking on the design day. So if you go online, you can find what's called... Um, uh, weather data and what they'll have is they'll tell you over the course of the year let's say toronto you can see how many days of the year you're at design condition in toronto you're probably only at design condition maybe five percent of the year so there's going to be quite a few heating days when you can supply a lot lower than the design temperature if this system was designed for what have you got there 160 at the first yeah. radiator. probably most of the year that radiator is going to be able to work at 130 140 150 degrees until you get to your design day so you will be condensing quite a bit of the year, but when you get the design days, you might not, that boiler, if it's on a reset control, is going to ramp up, ramp up to can cover the load. You might not be condensing and getting your 90% plus efficiency, but it brings a lot of other things to the game. When I talk to people that say, well, you know, a cast iron boiler are cheap, they last a long time, they work, blah, 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 but they don't modulate, they're bang, bang. If you've got a 100,000 BTU cast iron boiler, it's the day you turn it on, it's 100,000 BTU regardless of what's going on in the building so i think the price of the modulation is worth it just to have that even if you're not condensing in that boiler all the time because the boiler is going to modulate to load it's not going to bang on bang off bang on bang off every 15 minutes on a less than design day so if you add up the outdoor reset the modulation the ramp delay all the different things that you can do within the controls of the condensing boiler I think it's a no-brainer to replace, you know, even a high temperature boiler with a condensing boiler because it, it just brings a lot more um, technology to the game, really. There's yeah, there's no other presentations on our YouTube channel that Max and I have done and, and that we've done some with uh, IBC's training team where we talk about this. And really, it's, as Bob was saying, the ability to ramp this unit. These IBC units, I mean, we're fanboys of them for a reason, or I'm a fanboy of them for a reason. I can drop a secondary sensor on this supply line and this boiler will run itself at a 30 degree delta T and you don't need, you know, an 8R session on how to do it. It's a touchscreen express setup. Anybody can do it and I challenge you to try it and prove me wrong, which means you can actually run the boiler on a 30 degree delta T. This side of the system's running on something different and even at 160, 170, we can make this thing condense. So there's there's a lot to it. You just sort of have to think ahead and plan and incorporate a lot of the things that Bob just mentioned. The other thing you want to be very cautious of is look at how we pipe this. We made sure our condensing boiler is primary secondary. That to me is like the number one thing to pay attention to. There's a lot of train of thoughts of you can you can get rid of all this and, and you can just pump it directly and this pump can take care of it. I don't drink that Kool-Aid. I, I believe in the KISS method. I'm not saying it's wrong. 
I just know that what Max and Bob and I are showing you will work in every job you do. And you don't want the tech coming back to the shop saying, we had something really weird and now we got to repipe that whole thing because we tried to save this pump and a couple of closely spaced T's or a, or a hydraulic separator. Yeah, if you want to run those two different Delta T's, you're not going to be able to direct pipe that boiler. It's going to get what it gets coming back from that last oh, rate. Oh, sure. Yeah. You want to run the 30 degree Delta on the one side and the 15 degree on the other side. Then with the sensor and pipe with a the hydraulic separator like that, now you've got the ability to do that. And maybe the one outlier would be dedicated snowmelt boiler, single snowmelt zone. Or something like that. Maybe you can get away with that depending on the boiler and the pump and you know if you're doing the math correctly there, but there's just never a system that a hydro separator doesn't at least give you the ability to separate the two wheels. So Yeah, for sure. I mean, even with this boiler, if we had a small zone of radiant, you know, we could drop a single manifold in here. I mean, we've done that. If there's a tiny little zone, um, it's typically on a very small boiler and a very niche application, but Again, to Max's point, we're having the discussion, we're getting a phone call, we're doing calculations, we're not just going, ah, put it on high speed, you know, the, the old mentality. And, you know, I spent a lot of time in the field before I got to work with people like Bob and Max and, you know, do the design work. I was in that shoe, you know, I, I didn't know better when the guy, the journeyman would say, put the pump on high. I went, yes, sir, it's on high. You know, um, I'll get comments from people, well, we never get complaints when we do it. And sometimes I got to bite my tongue and go, yeah, I didn't get the complaint, but Max did, right? Max got the call. He's like, hey, Mike was out here and put it on high. Can you come out and fix it? Yeah. And in some cases, all Max might do is put it on low speed. Now, obviously, this is all shop talk in theory. Max hasn't been in my jobs, right, Max? Come on now. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, just because you never got called back doesn't mean it worked. It just means you yeah. didn't get called back. And we want to be conscious of that. And I think that's why so many people have showed up tonight, so we can talk about that. Um, Mark had the question. I think we talked about it. Does closely spaced T's do the same thing as a hydraulic separator? The answer is yes. Um, a SEP4 can also do a lot more because it also would do the work of our inline air separator that would appear on the supply line and the dirt separator not shown that would be on the return line. So yes, it's hydraulic separation, but it's also a lot more. Um, Bruce asked a question we've already covered. Oh, this is a good one. So, um, could you take and thread an air separator directly onto a boiler? Um, yeah, I mean, I guess the older boilers had the, you know, air separator built into it. In some cases, there is an air vent, um, attached to a, a ModCon boiler, a new ModCon boiler. Um, but it's not an air separator. That's just kind of a high point vent that you can get a little bubble of air out. It's not an ongoing multi-pass, you know, high efficiency air scrubber as much as it's just like a little coin valve to bleed the top of the heat exchanger because it's a high point. Yeah, we want to have a little bit of straight piping before we go into the air separator. But off that fire tube, you've got some straight piping inside of it. You just you simply uh, can't see. Um, Bob, your thoughts, if I wanted to put an air separator right on that unit? Yeah, I mean, in Europe, a lot of our air separators inside the boilers, they have these combination little polymer, it's a pump, it's an air separator, it's everything in a monoblock system, and it's right under the hood of that boiler. So again, it's really the high temperature that's doing most of the work or air removal. And if, you know, if the chamber's big enough that you can slow the velocity down, even if you're over pumping the system, I mean, we test our air separators all the way out to 10 feet per second velocities to make sure that if somebody is over pumping a system which happens uh they still work so um yeah i mean if you could put it right you know a close nipple underneath that boiler there that would be a good spot for an air separator yeah so i'm just going to pull up a photo here really quickly so this is an sl boiler uh the sl boiler actually has two ports on the right hand side so you can put your indirect right on it two yeah. ports on the left hand side so if you put an air separator right on here, you've got enough straight pipe inside that unit that we're not too worried about any kind of lack of turbulence happening there. The only thing I will tell you, Mark, is having done it myself in our lab, we put flanges directly on here, figuring, hey, we're going to save that piece. Yeah, the handle doesn't turn so good. So definitely don't ever try to put a flange uh, yeah. directly on that. You guys probably that are all participating realize that because you're flanging more stuff now than I am. I, I don't do it day to day like like you guys do anymore. I'm, I'm at a desk most of the time. So um, some of the newer boilers from IBC has two connections off the bottom. 
which is what we're uh, illustrating in the CAD that we've been showing you as we go along. So, uh, yeah, so uh, Steve is just saying, uh, couldn't we use a scoop and an air, at the air vent at the highest point to get all the air out of the boiler? Um, Max, you want to just quickly touch on entrained air and how that's not really going to come out of the system? Yeah, so that could be helpful for you filling the system, um, but it's it's not going to catch that. The the smaller air bubbles would go right through a, a scoop over and over and over again and could still be noisy and be enough to you know be uh, corroding the different ferrous components in the system. It's just not a high performance air scrubber. Um, it helps to get the bulk air. It would be better than just uh, you know an air not vent in a T or something because it at least has like a little baffle there to scoop it up, but um, it's it's different from a high performance. So here's starter. what happens inside the boilers. Every time the boiler turns on and heats up and the burner hits that metal, air is driven out of solution. And when that burner turns off in the fall for the whole summer, at the end of the day, if it's a mild day or something like that, that air that you never got out of there goes back into solution. And what you don't want on a high efficiency boiler especially is you don't want little air bubbles on the metal because when the burner comes on and you got a paper thin heat exchanger now compared to a quarter inch of cast iron, those air bubbles acts as insulation and the heat from the burner isn't getting to the water because you've actually put an R value of air bubbles against that wall of that thing. So that air, if you don't get it out of there, that tiny little micro bubble and trained air that you can't even see, it looks like milky water when you, if you go to your kitchen faucet tonight, fill up a glass and notice how it's milky for a minute, that's because there's entrained air in there. And a second later, that's gonna clear up because you've taken the pressure off your water. When you take it out of the faucet at 80 PSI and put it in an open container, that milky water turns into clear water. Well, yeah. that's what happens in a boiler when you heat it up. And if you don't have a good air scrubber that's gonna take that air out at some point in the life of that boiler, that air is in there and it's not good for your heat exchanger, it's not good for your pump. And the same thing happens at your radiators. You don't want a layer of air bubble in your heat exchanger at your radiator, at your fin tube, in your radiant tube, whatever it might be. You want solid water touching the metal and that's why we wanna get those micro bubbles out of there. And that's why we're such big proponents of the micro bubble scrubbers is what they really are, is they take that milky water dissolved and trained air out of the system that a scoop just can't do it. There's no mechanism. Now, if you took a scoop and cut it open and shove something in it like this media right here, now you'd have a great air eliminator yeah. because it's the media that's grabbing those little bubbles as they go through there and, and pull them out of solution. So I'm, I'm going to do a really crummy drawing here. So if I, if I do my primary over here, and then I'm going to come off of here with my short fat header. You can tell why Mike doesn't draw things by hand, but I think you get the idea. So I've got my three beautiful returns like this. And then if my indirect comes off of this side, which is what the piping's for, which is really ingenious, credit to Don and the whole team at IBC for coming up with this piping arrangement on their boilers. What you'll see people do, and we've done is they'll put the air separator right here, right? So the idea behind that is your domestic hot water is running all year round. So you're constantly getting air out of the system. The only thing that I'll caution you is if you look at the heat exchanger and what Max described to set for in a hydraulic separator, it's a wide body with pipes on both sides of it, right? So uh, that looks familiar. So be careful doing this. You, you do wanna make sure you flush all of the air out of this side of the system, because yep. if you're just doing it here, uh, we, we had some fun. We discovered pretty quickly, it works great, but you gotta make sure you properly flush the entire system, uh, get all of the air out of it. The other thing that's, that's worth mentioning is that if you've got really bad water uh, and you've got no air in the system, you're in pretty good shape, right? The, the challenge is we do want to control both of those situ situations so that we're not oxidizing, we're not eating anything in the system. So, um, well, Eric wants to know what are what are the thoughts on a bypass fine filter? Max, bypass fine filter versus a dirt separator or with a dirt separator? What are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean the anything with a filter, it's like picture a. Uh, uh, chain link fence with a bunch of leaves but the more leaves that blow up against that fence you can reduce the flow through that that system so um it is something that a, a dirt separator is made to hit you know the dirt hits it and falls out of the path of the flow so it doesn't restrict the the pump 
So anything that's a filter will get dirty and then be more resistant. So, I mean, I guess as a, as a bypass, maybe, but then you still have dirt that can go right around through it. It's, uh, it's something that will start to wear out your pump, like a Y strainer that's full of dirt that hasn't ever been flushed, um, where we want to get that dirt kind of out of the circulation and have it in the bottom of the bell of that device where we can flush it out and get it out of the system instead of just having it plug and then eventually blow through a Y strainer. Because if you got a really, really small, you know, mesh Y strainer, it's going to catch everything, but it's probably not going to make your pump very happy right away. So. Yeah, so I pulled up a couple of uh, cutaways just so everybody can see what we're looking at here. With this dirt separator that Max is talking about, as the water as the water flows through it, the dirt drops out of it. It's great. I've got a brown color all of a sudden, hard to see. If we were to do the same thing with a Y strainer, I'm just going to pull one up here really quickly um, to show Max's point on this. Uh, what'll end up happening is we're actually going to restrict the flow, right? So as we go into this Y strainer, we build all this crap up inside of it. Somebody's got to come out and clean this thing out. It, it's not going to hold a lot of space. The other thing about a Y strainer or any kind of a bypass filter is you've got to set your microns on that, right? If you look at those dirt separators by Kalefi, they've got a really nice chart that shows you, here's how much you can remove if it was a dirt separator with coalescing media, et cetera, for air versus you know, something like this and what you're going to be able to get out of it. It's, it's not comparing apples to apples by any means. Yeah, you're adding uh, pressure drop to your system. Even a brand new one inch Y strainer right off the shelf with a one with a number 20 mesh strainer in it adds about three feet of uh, pressure drop to your system. So as that plugs up the first day you put it in there, unless somebody goes back you know, probably the first week and maybe every year and takes it out and cleans it, you, you're, you're, you know, you're just reducing the flow that's available to your pumps and to your system because of the pressure drop to it. So you got to service them. Any kind of filter or strainer that you put in needs to be serviced. I would say a side stream is probably better because only a portion of the water is going to be going through it, but it's still going to plug up if it's doing its job. If that's why you put it in there is to filter stuff out, you got yeah. to service it. So. Yeah, so this I, I Googled to get a cutaway and it took us to Eden's blog, so we must be doing something right. Uh, I just wanted to show this. So you can see here, uh, this is that chart that I was referring to. And again, you guys can reach out to me afterwards to talk more about this. Here's the effective operation of the Y strainer in comparison to the size of the debris. And then we look at the dirt cow, like it, it's not even the same conversation here, right? We're, we're removing very, very fine stuff. We're just moving, you know, the big crap. Uh, to go back, I'm just gonna scroll up to sort of give that perspective. The Y strainer is taking this crap out, whereas uh, the dirt cow is taking out the stuff, you know, that's floating around in here that's coming out over time. So, well, so for an example, if you could look at the dirt cow there down to a five micron, take and pull a hair out of your head if you still have hair on your head. That's about a five micron. A Y strainer isn't going to pull a five micron unless you put like an 80 mesh or a real tight one, but then it's going to plug up almost instantly. So that's the, the kind of catch 22 of the Y strainer is how fine is fine enough that it doesn't plug up immediately, but it still gets the stuff that I don't want in my pumps, like the magnetite, the really tiny, tiny particles. Yeah. Uh, Charles has a good question on indirects. Uh, is there a minimum size boiler you should use if you have an indirect? Uh, I'm going to drop this indirect back in really quickly. Um, the key to keep in mind with the indirect is it really does come down to your choice of boiler and how you pipe it. So we, uh, Max and, and Bob and I already pointed out, this is how we would like you to pipe it. The beauty of it, uh, that's pretty close to what I wanted to do. The beauty of it is in this configuration, when this comes on, this SL or VX, there's two models from IBC, it's smart enough that it knows it's the indirect call. So if this is a 100,000 BTUs, that'd be good for a 30 or 40 gallon indirect, depending on your recovery time. It's not idling at 10,000 BTUs. It sees this call, it knows it's an indirect, it's going to full ramp, which Bob talked about, and it's gonna drive as much energy as it can. It's not gonna to try to modulate or condense, it's gonna to try to make sure they've got hot water when they need it. Bob, any, any comments on indirects and sizing with mod cons? Yeah, I mean, in the 40 years that I've been plumbing, I haven't had a homeowner yet that can tell me how much hot water they use or need or want. So at some point, you know, you really got to know what they expect. If they've got four kids that take 20 minute long showers each back to back, 
you either got to make the water instantly for them to keep up with that load or have a big buffer tank or a, you know, a bulk load to dump it. What I will say is Pierre over there at uh, TurboMax has a really good software. And if you can give them that data, say, well, I need this much water continuously or I need this much for a hotel at a dump load at five o'clock at night, they can size those reverse indirects to cover that. You know, when a hotel and everybody takes a shower at the same time at eight o'clock in the morning, at five o'clock at night, you got to be able to cover that load. Residentially, you probably won't get in trouble, but if you're doing commercial work, you just got to know what the load is, or you're just, you're really guessing at how big a tank, how big a boiler, how big a pump. It's just like a heat load on a house. You know, when you're doing domestic water, you really should know what, what the load is or your, your guess. And most of the time, we probably oversize them. Once in my life, I undersized it. It was a guy that owns Bass Pro, and I put in a 120-gallon indirect tank thinking, oh, I got this guy covered. I didn't do the plumbing on the house, and two weeks after they moved in, they said, we're running out of hot water every day. I said, I got a 200,000 B2 boiler and a 120-gallon tank in there. Well, he had a two-person bathtub that he fills up twice a day that held like 300 gallons of water. It was six feet long and four feet wide. I never assumed that he was going to be filling that tub twice a day in 15 minutes with a high flow thing. So I had to go back and put it on my nickel, another 120 gallon buffer tank in and give him 240 gallon dump to fill up that tub twice a day. It's just the way it is. It just takes horsepower to make a lot of hot water quickly. Yeah. So just to sort of add to that, uh, Max and I did a training. It's actually right here on our YouTube channel. And so what that one was on is domestic hot water mixing. And we have some tools available that we cover in that from the standpoint of sizing. Uh, to Bob's point is you always have to have the conversation. Uh, I think I speak for Max, Bob, and myself. We've all been in the scenario where we thought we were covered and we weren't. And unfortunately, the lessons we learned that are most effective is where we made a mistake. Um, you know, if anybody tells you, uh, my jobs all went perfect, again, they didn't call you back. They called Max or Bob back. Um, the yeah. best lessons I had is where I did something that should have worked, uh, and it didn't. And it's like, ah, uh, you know, uh, but fortunately, if you got a lot of smart friends, you can figure it out. Um, Phil is adding to the comment on that. So Phil said, I had issues with a TurboMax where the client changed the shower heads to rain shower heads. Uh, so you definitely need to understand flow at faucets, tub showers, etc. Absolutely. If you put a heat pump on a TurboMax, you're five gallons a minute. If they're filling that tub Bob had, you're getting a phone call really quickly. Um, always make sure you size it up front. We're happy to help you call us. We can go through it and talk about it. Um, Mohinder is asking, can you cool the house with radiators in summer by passing chilled water from the air to heat pump? And can you use the same thermostatic valves installed on the radiators? So Bob Mohinder is asking, could we put chilled water through those cast rads? To a point, you, what the problem is with chilling with a radiator like that is the dew point. Once that water gets a certain temperature, you're going to start to sweat those radiators. So, you know, if you're in an area where you have high humidity, like here where I'm in Utah, the second driest state in the nation, uh, we can get away with radiant cooling because we don't have to worry about that sweating on the radiators and pipes. But I would say back in your neck of the woods, you'd probably want to put a dew point control on it. You can maybe pick up some of your yeah. cooling load, but... I bet I, there's not many I places go, you're going to I would go further and it. say, please don't do that because yeah. you either will get condensation or not enough capacity to even have made it worth it for the, the money yeah. to install the system. So you can do uh, radiant cooling, uh, but you need a lot more surface area because you need to be able to go with, uh, you know, you can't get a radiator or anything too cold or it's going to sweat or you just don't have the capacity to make sense out of it. So radiant yeah. cooling with, a whole, you know, floor of PEX uh, is a potential, not a not a single ice cold radiator. Yeah, or radiant ceilings can work pretty yeah. well for that too, because you want your cooling up high. The cold air comes down, but yeah, you really want to yeah. design that. You don't want to guess at that because it's a surface area game. It's all about the surface area. You know, the more surface area, the lower the temperature, both for your, you know, heating and for cooling. It's it's all about how much area you can put that temperature on. Yeah, so I, I agree with uh, with Bob and Max. And it probably won't be any shock to anybody. I wouldn't be putting chilled water through those units. Uh, these these water to waters or air to water units have the ability to do chilled water. This is just a conceptual we're doing. This is for somebody's pool. They've got 10 tons of water to water equipment to uh, do heating and cooling. So in this case, we're doing uh, cooling through air handlers using some divertings. We've got a cooling tank and a heating tank. 
this is a really expensive way to air condition and heat a pool. Um, but one of the things I've learned in this industry is my budget is not everybody's budget. You know, we, we worked on the most expensive home in Canada. I, I think it was somewhere around $140 million. Uh, to them, a, a $400,000 mechanical system was nothing. They, they were shocked it was so cheap. So, you know, I know Max wants a $400,000 mechanical system, but, you know, he's, he's getting a big, big Kalefi bus, right, Bob? <laughs> You really need to move air to cool. I mean, you want to move air anyways just to keep the house healthy. So you want to, you know, you got to pick up that latent load and the sensible load. So moving air really ends up being. Now that being said, I haven't been back yeah. there, but Taco headquarters they've got radiant uh, uh, ceilings in there. They've got some chilled beams or something, and it does and can work. I know Johnny was pretty nervous the day they had the grand opening. He kept looking up there to see if they're going to start dripping because with that many people in there and that dew point, boy, you gotta have a tech mark control on there with a dew point control. Oh, yeah, residentially radiant cooling, I wouldn't touch it. It's I, Even commercially, I don't want to touch it. The liability to you, like if, if we pipe this, like this is a pretty complicated mechanical. If we pipe this wrong, like Max and I could go back and be, oh crap, we can fix that. If, if we were to put chilled beams in without a dew point control or to Max's point, do a radiant slab, oh man, if we screw that up, we've actually messed the entire house up. Like we've rotted that house. I've only been in a house once in the 20 years I've been on the design side of things, and they were concerned about the equipment. I had to drill holes in the bottom of the heat pumps to let the water out. The water had pooled right up onto the boards, and the homeowner was pissed off about the units, and I was concerned why he wasn't worried about his house that was rotting around. Like, yeah, he needed two new heat pumps, but he also needed a new house. So I was like, uh, let's, let's pick our battles on what we want to do. So I'm not a big fan of doing it. Yeah, radiant cooling is a commercial new construction is is kind of the sweet spot for that. 100%. Keiko does it. Uh, I know Mike Miller and, and Guyberson and Dave and the team, they've got a great way of doing with chilled beams. Commercially, it makes a ton of sense. We would definitely work with you on that. But residentially, it's not worth the risk. And the know-how isn't there. It's, if you've only done boilers, it's not something you can just do. Even guys doing heat pumps can't jump into a chilled beam and expect to have everything covered. You're looking at thousands of dollars in controls just to make sure you don't rot that house. You have to pay attention to it. I would say play around with one in your own house first before you start selling them and just see what the ins and outs yeah. and what, what the pitfalls are. We've got a... We, it was that easy. Got really nice lab where we do that. We've had chillers for a long time and it's we've had piping and radiators that if it could work, it, it would have been done already. So. Yeah, for sure. Alan's got a good comment. He says, Dan Houlihan, uh, Houlihan pardon me, uh, has a really good piece about using old hot cast iron rads and uh, windows for ventilation that really helps in the age of COVID. That's a great comment. Thank you, Alan, for sharing that. Uh, you know, Dan is kind of like Siggy. If he's got something to say, it's, it's definitely worth reading. You'll learn something. And um, he's a great all around guy. Um, Errol makes a great comment about the best part about using the DMF. So this is this instead of an autofill, you don't need a backflow. So if you look in Ontario, you got to get your backflow tested every year in some jurisdictions. That's like a $250 charge to you, yeah. and not everybody can do it. You got to have a special certification to do that work. Um, yeah. That's another argument why we do the DMF. So thank you, Errol. You threw the point in that I didn't mention. Well, the other um, thing is, you know, if your if your system has a leak on a radiant tubing system, you know, if there's a leak in it because the uh, it'll run out of water and alarm. Where an autofill will just keep filling your water in your system. Yeah. And, yeah no, I, there, there's a lot of good reasons to do that, and uh, yeah, that, that's a great comment. And yeah, you can't flood a basement. Uh, about once every two years, I get the phone call where somebody has flooded a basement, and it sucks. You know, it's they go to Florida. They sprung a leak somewhere and they come back to two feet of water. I hate when I get those phone calls. It's not my fault, but they're calling to share their misery and I, I don't like hearing it. Uh, using that DMF is a great way to avoid that. On paper, it might look like more money, but it's a little bit more money up front to save them money every year on backflow testing. And God forbid they spring a leak somewhere, as Bob rightly pointed out. They don't have to worry about that. Uh, Rainier has a really good question, Bob. So what he wants to know is if we reduce this green piping here without doing monoflow tees, could we simulate a monoflow tee? Yeah, if you could know how much to choke that down. I mean, that's all a monoflow tee is, is a ball valve that there's no hand on. It's just a restriction orifice that was put in there. So if you could put some kind of device, a valve in there and just get them all adjusted, I mean, that's you've got an adjustable monoflow system if you put a valve between those two and just, you'd have to go around and play around with that and get them all set at the right 
uh, point to, to put that restriction. That's all you're doing is putting a restriction between those two T's. So some of the flow goes through the radiator and some of it uh, goes straight through the, the green piping. So um, yeah, I mean, it, the monoflow T is just a, a disc and a T. There's really no So I, I downsized this while we were talking. So we were going from about one foot per hundred. I dropped it down to half inch just between these feeders and I'm at 20 feet per hundred. Yeah. I'm not sure that's going to be enough to do it. So maybe we can't do it. Maybe we got to go smaller on piping. It's hard to say, but we definitely have more pressure drop here now than we do here. So yeah. in theory, yeah, the pipe's going to go around, come through and go out. Um, it's a good thought. That's why we like doing this. We get some great comments. I, I think that would work. How about you, Max? Yeah, it'd be a lot of trial and error. And I think that you'd want to make it if you, if you. I, I would prefer, uh, I, I think I would honestly prefer this route. Yeah. And the T's might, they might not be where you can get to them all the time yeah. either. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's it's definitely interesting. Great question. Uh, definitely like that. Uh, Gary says he quits testing water when it gets to 150 grains of hardness. That little TDS uh, that also does uh, EC that I bought, I, I think it was 30 bucks. Uh, we keep 10 or 20 on the shelf for guys because they're really inexpensive. We like to have them take it. It doesn't take any skill to test it, and you can find out whether your water is good, bad, or otherwise. Uh, pH meter is the same. I, I keep a pH meter to try to make sure my pH is in check as well. Uh, lots of good comments I think we covered. Well, I think we actually addressed everything at this point. I think we answered most of the questions. Uh, if anybody has questions, uh, you know, you wake up tomorrow morning and you've got a, a question, uh, you can certainly reach out to me by email at any time. Uh, everybody who's registered obviously uh, has my email address. I, I do read all the replies, as do Max and Bob. So if you get a question, we're happy to answer those questions. Um, the phone number you see on the screen is our 800 number. Uh, extension 206 specifically rings the hydronics team. So the people that answer that are our hydronics team. You're not going to get a heat pump person or a mechanical ventilation person. Um, I figured that was the right extension for this webinar. Um, but you can also email me. Uh, Bob, any closing thoughts before we move on? Um, no, thanks everybody for showing up. And uh, um, yeah, whatever questions you have, if we can help, we certainly don't know everything. And if we don't, we can usually find somebody that has an answer if we don't have it. So <clears throat> if not, we'll make something up. <laughs> Max, how about you? I, I mean, I think that's kind of fun to cover about 100 years of uh, hydronics there. And uh, yeah, to be able to still address and work on and fix these systems with what's in a warehouse today is, is kind of a cool thing in our industry. So yeah, thanks for uh, spearheading the, the conversation here. Yeah, no, I appreciate both of you guys joining. I think it was a, a great topic. We got to cover three generations, three perspectives, three different types of systems. Obviously, we thank the hundreds of people that showed up today for this webinar. Uh, if you leave this webinar with questions, you can call me anytime, you can email me anytime, you can talk to anybody on our team. We're here to help. Uh, the other side of it is if you wake up tomorrow and go, geez, I got a really cool topic that I wish Max and Bob and Mike or maybe we have a different guest speaker. Could you guys talk about this? Or maybe you just want Max and I to jump on and draw some systems, draw up some systems and talk about them. We love the feedback. Some of the best ideas that the, we come up with is people reaching out and saying, could you do this? And, you know, we don't mind doing that. Uh, if you and your team, you know, if you're an engineering group or a contractor group and you want some one-on-one -on -one training, we do that as well. Uh, we, don't, we don't charge for that for our customers in Ontario. Uh, if you're outside of Ontario and need some help, I'll loop you in with Max and he can put you in touch with somebody who's outside of Ontario and they would be uh, happy to help you. So at that point, uh, I'm going to close it off again. Bob, Max, thank you. It's been great hanging out again. We'll do it again soon. To everybody who showed up, same. Thank you for coming and we look forward to hearing more from you. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Thanks, guys.